This episode of Tales from the Backlog is brought to you by the wonderful patrons over at patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson. Some personal heroes of mine, like Chris Nelson, the top three podcast crew, Zul Geek, Eric Guess, Rick Firestone, Nick Ficori, Jill, Soccer, ZNA, Cupcake, Kyle, Christian S., Matt, aka Stormageddon, JD, Doug Leaf, Jason Emery, Rob Shack, Brian Skersha, Randall, and many more have all chosen to go to patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson to kick me a few bucks a month and help support the show. I appreciate all of them very much, and if you're listening and you want to support the show like that, you can go once again to patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson, where in return for a generous donation, you will get bonus episodes of the show, the ability to vote on polls for what game I cover on the show, and much more. Any and all support in any form is always appreciated, and with that being said, let us get on to The Witcher 2. Hello everybody, my name is Dave Jackson and you're listening to Tales from the Backlog. This is a video games review podcast where each week I'm joined by a guest to bring a game out of the backlog, play it, and discuss. My guests today are longtime friends of the show, hosts of your friendly neighborhood gamers and professional king slayers, Andrew Kimball and Dylan Wren. Welcome back to the show, guys. Hey, thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. Of course. Longtime listeners of the show will recognize these guys from several episodes in the past. We did a couple of FromSoft episodes, Bloodborne Bosses tier list, mm-hmm. and a, an Elden Ring slash open world game discussion. And then Andrew was a part of the Near Automata episode as well. So good to have you both back. And before we get into our game today, which is The Witcher 2, Assassins of Kings, I want to give you guys the floor, as always, to just talk about what's going on on your friendly neighborhood gamers these days. Uh, let's see. Well, right now, the world of gaming is just firing on all cylinders. So we've mm-hmm. got episodes on some of the big games like Tears of the Kingdom. We actually recently did a Breath of the Wild episode as well. But um, so episodes like that, diving into some of these big releases, but also, you know, doing the thing we like to do where we just talk about games that we're enjoying regardless Mm -hmm. of when they came out or whatever. Um, Still doing some interviews over on the podcast, but yeah, it's, it's been a lot of big games coming out. Let's play them and then talk about them, you know, probably like a month or so after they came out because that's when we got to finish them. But yeah, Mm -hmm. so the podcast just trucking along, having a great old time. Uh, Dylan, what's going on over on the YouTube? Uh, we've been trying out some new f- like formats this summer, um, just while we've both had a little bit more time, just to see if we like any of that uh, any better. And if it does any better, uh, just in the algorithm or, or whatever. Um, so we've been, we've been enjoying that, uh, having a lot of fun with that. Um, so in general, we put out some like short reviews kind of usually about stuff that's a little bit older and just kind of like hey is this still worth like going back to and trying out in 2023 um sometimes we'll do some rankings sometimes we'll do just some like tips or uh, like we've got one out there about like hey i really like destiny 2 uh if you're trying to get into destiny 2 you've never played it before it's a nightmare because there are so many different things to <laughs> to look at and that they want you to buy and so i break down like what i think is worth buying uh first and and all of that kind of stuff so um it's it's kind of all over the place but there's a lot of good stuff on there if you're interested in checking it out yeah since the last time you guys were on the show i think you've at least you've started to do it more often the neighborhood watch episodes on the podcast Mm -hmm. where you just Mm -hmm. kind of talk about the stuff you've been playing and sometimes bring in guests to talk about that stuff too and um i i love those episodes just always um i just enjoy hearing people talk about the games they're playing and um the youtube videos are nice too they're real short uh really digestible um i just watched one 
Well, I watched two recently. One was like, uh, is Diablo three still good, uh, mm-hmm. this year? And the other one that I thought was a really cool idea was the, uh, new players to Diablo four tips for new players, not tips for how to grind the end game for hundreds of hours and, and kill like the toughest shit. I don't know anything about Diablo, yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, for people like me, you know, if I were to buy Diablo four tips for me. So yeah. I, I appreciate those too. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's that's in general what we try to approach like our channel from is just kind of like, hey, you can you have no shortage of channels out there for like IGN and all of those for like the hardcore gamers that are, you know, dumping 300 hours into games like Diablo 4 in its first like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we want to hit it from like the more average, casual, like normal person playing video games and enjoying them sort of vibe. So, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, as always, I give the recommendation for everyone to check out the YouTube channel uh, if you want those short videos. And of course, check out the podcast for your friendly neighborhood gamers. There's links down in the show notes uh, for everyone who wants to check it out. So let's get into our game for today, which is The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings. This is an action RPG developed and published by CD Projekt Red for PC and Xbox 360 in 2011. And if you have not played The Witcher 2, you kn- you kind of know where some of these characters end up because some of them come back in The Witcher 3. But regardless, we're not going to spoil what goes on in the story. W- one thing that I think is very cool about this game is the different ways that your story can go. So mm-hmm. we're going to save all that for the spoiler section, of course, as always on the show. So to give a little pitch for what The Witcher 2 is all about, I like I kind of get this feeling that... So many people played The Witcher 3, or you're at least like very familiar with The Witcher 3. And The Witcher 2 was acclaimed back in the day, but I don't hear people talk about this game ever anymore, Mm -hmm. uh, except for Joseph Anderson and that six hour uh, amazing (laughs) YouTube video. So uh, some elevator pitches for this game. Um, I'm saying that this is a giant experiment in storytelling and branching paths starring everybody's favorite Witcher. What would you guys say? Uh, I put that it's a more compact experience than The Witcher 3 uh, with a deep, complex story. Just don't come for the combat. (laughs) Yeah, and I think I would say that if you enjoyed The Witcher 3, but if you want something with a more um, political storyline, you want to see more of the, the politics and the things going on with more of the world, this game has that for you. But again, yeah, the combat is not its strongest point. So um, I played this on PC this time around uh, when I actually got around to playing the whole game. It took me 21 hours. So like you guys said, it's a much more compact experience. It is not a 100 hour game like the third game is. Um, Do you guys know about how long a playthrough took you? Uh, I would say it's probably it's probably a little bit higher than that. 20 hours for me personally, just uh i think my first playthrough of the game i explored like absolutely everywhere like dug Mm -hmm. into every every single little thing um i would say if you're doing that it's maybe like 30 hours um yeah but it's still not a long like you said it's not as huge and expansive as the witcher 3 like there are side quests but it's not like everywhere you go, there are like 500 side quests popping up right. on your map. It's like, <laughs> hey, here's four in this section of the game exactly. or something yeah, like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, and it's not an open world game, so it, mm-hmm. it, there's not as much of that exploring and coming across like a notice board or whatever. My original playthrough was probably on the higher end because this was a time, you know, I played this back when it was relatively new and I was not the gamer I am today and this game is <laughs> is a little bit janky and doesn't do the best job of kind of explaining what you're supposed to do next or where you're supposed to go and so I'm sure there was a lot of like just running around <laughs> trying mm-hmm. to figure out what I was supposed to do yeah um <laughs> but still yeah ultimately it's not the longest game and I think part of that is probably because they want you to play both paths yeah and so they keep it a little bit shorter so that you know kind of like that Resident Evil thing but not that short but where you can go back and you can play the other path but not feel like you're committing to another 70 hours of game. Exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say like, it is a shorter game, 20 hours for me, but it is a game that if you want to fully experience the story, you need to play it two times. Mm -hmm. 
pick there's a fork where you pick basically which story you want and so you need to play it twice to see the whole thing i only played it once i watched the rest on youtube uh, <laughs> just how it goes and again big props to uh to joseph anderson for that video for helping me out with the other path and uh like i'm sure you guys um will have some of that perspective as well so mm-hmm. we'll get into our personal histories with this what made us want to play this um it sounds like all three of us played this before the witcher 3 came out so yes. i will turn it over to you guys if it wasn't you know you played the witcher 3 and want to go back and play the other games in the series what was it about this game that made you want to play it? So this game was actually given away as like a games with gold for Xbox um, in like 20. It was before The Witcher 3 came out. Um, and so it was probably like, hey, we're going to give this game away for free. Go check it out. And maybe you'll buy The Witcher 3. Yeah, it was probably right um, before Witcher 3 came out. Yeah, yeah. it was sometime <laughs> in like early 2015. Um, so I got the game then and... You know, I I just get whatever the free game is uh, when it releases half the time, probably 80 percent of the time. I don't even like download it or like look at it ever again. I'm just like, I what if what if I want to play this, though? Um, But one of my friends was like my roommate was staying with me. So we just had kind of like the Xbox set up. And so one time he was playing uh, and he was like, dude, you have to check out, like, just watch this opening, like, cutscene. And so they have, like, <laughs> the little thing where, like, the the assassin, like, it, it's it's not a spoiler because it's literally, like, you turn the game on and this right, happens. Yeah. But, it's like, before the main the, menu yeah. comes up. Yeah. And, and so it's, like, this really high quality, like, CGI thing where, like, this guy is going in and assassinating this king or whatever. And I was like, this is super cool. And so um, I ended up playing through the game at that point. And like I thought it was a good game, but I I knew nothing about like The Witcher. <laughs> like this mm-hmm. was my first exp- like exposure to The Witcher. After playing this game, I did go and like buy The Witcher 1 for PC and made it maybe like the first like either the prologue or first act through the game. Like I got mm-hmm. to the part where you get into the city basically and then I was like this there's a lot of jank in this game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I kind of just fell off of it. Yeah. But I did start trying to like read the Witcher books uh, for a little bit after that. I never made it through those either, as is uh, tradition with me. Uh But (laughs) um, just because like there's a lot that goes on in this game. That like is not you don't have to know like the Witcher lore, but it sure makes a whole lot more sense if you have some background in the Witcher lore. Yeah. And so I was trying to like understand what I had played. And then eventually The Witcher 3 came out and I spent like seven years playing that game uh, and yeah. finally beat it uh, <laughs> this past like year. <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah, for me, I, I just looked it up. And so this game and Dark Souls, the first one came out like the same year. Yeah. And I'm I'm always looking for some sort of a, a, a like Knights and Dragons fantasy adventure. Like that is my genre. And so I'm pretty sure probably it must have been like the year after or something because I don't think I played it like on release date. But I tried Dark Souls 1. No idea what those games were at the time and was like, oh, this is not for me. <laughs> and then not long after that, probably saw The Witcher and was like, oh, this is kind of that similar vibe, you know, fantasy, it's dark, all that kind of stuff. I'll try this one. And it, the the opening cinematic, yeah, from that moment on, I was hooked. And yeah, the game has a lot of jank and a lot of systems and level design and all sorts of things that they definitely improved upon greatly with The Witcher 3. But I, I was able to see past all that because I hadn't really played a game like this when it came to giving you choices and neither one was the obvious good one and Mm -hmm. you know actually dealing with that and the story being as kind of mature and and deep as it was and and the whole thing just hooked me the universe pretty much immediately hooked me and it kind of started my my obsession with the witcher universe as soon as i finished this game i was like hype levels through the roof ready for the next one Mm -hmm. hell yeah So I played this like it was either the year it came out or the year after it came out pretty soon after it released, because I remembered 
uh, reading reviews like IGN and stuff. And this game got a bunch of acclaim and like game of the year type buzz back then. And I was like, oh, this game's cool. And kind of like you, Andrew, I'm, I'll always at least like check out like a, a cool fantasy thing that gets good reviews. I'm all about it. So yeah. I picked this up. Um, I took it home. I played it for, I don't know, a half hour and I hated it so much. I drove <laughs> back to GameStop and returned it. I, I could, and it was the, um, it was the, the arena tutorial, mm, just the tutorial, yeah. which I, I, like I heard was like not in the original game or something like that. And they like had yeah. to put this tutorial in to teach people all of these systems and all these controls and shit. And the tutorial is awful also. So just like a real bad start. So yeah. I took it back to GameStop and returned it. And then I played The Witcher 3 in like 2018 or something like that. Um, I adore that game. It's one of my favorite games ever. So I've always had this nagging thing of like, hey, maybe like, you know, you've you've grown as a person since 2012, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit. So maybe go back and try The Witcher 2 again. And I also went back and tried The Witcher 1. And I made it to the part where you get into the city. And I was like, yep. I think I get it. I think I'm done. <laughs> yep. But um, it's, you know, I don't think that game's bad. It's just like, it's real weird. Like there's yeah. nothing like that game. And I, yeah. I played it for about 10 or 15 hours. And I was like, I, I get it. And then wanted to play something else. Have you yeah. like looked into kind of the history of CD Projekt Red and like the Witcher series and all that to kind of if you if you like I watched some documentaries and stuff about yeah them coming up as a studio and they were like a, they were kind of just like a port translation studio for a lot yeah. of like uh, CRPGs back in the day and mm -hmm. they wanted to kind of strike out and do their own thing and obviously the Witcher is just huge over in Poland and so they wanted to make a Witcher game, but it's it's like the little engine that could. They're just this like ragtag team of developers that want to do this cool thing. Mm -hmm. And so they make this PC game, The Witcher, and it actually does OK. And then The Witcher 2 is their first attempt at a console game alongside it. And it's pretty obvious yeah. that they, you know, it was like their first strike into this. And then The Witcher 3, they just managed to kind of strike gold and and do well enough to get kind of mass appeal, which then, you know, brought on the whole cyberpunk thing. Yeah. But I mean, even The Witcher 3 releasing in the day and age that it did, they were able to kind of fix a lot of things on the fly, like post launch, mm -hmm. whereas The Witcher 2, like they released the enhanced edition and they tweaked some stuff and, you know, maybe made it look a little better and whatnot. But the core gameplay is is what it is, you know. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's it came out in 2011, you know, like yeah. it was on the 360 and PC yeah. and I assume PS3, but I don't actually know that. And so. Yeah, it's it's definitely like a back in the day before a bunch of updates were common, a bunch of like DLC was common, a bunch of like it was still in the early stages where it was kind of just yeah. like the game is the game and we might fix a couple little things, but it's pretty much just this. Yeah, the kind of I'm glad I did play The Witcher 1 for just the short time that I did because mm -hmm. it did give me some context cuz this The Witcher 2 really feels like a bridge between like the Witcher one is like a computer ass computer game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. the Witcher three is like a triple a open world game. And this is the mm -hmm. bridge uh, yep. in a lot of ways. And that's kind of just like the general feeling I had. And also like, like I talked about in the elevator pitch the I really respect and like enjoyed how many choices you can make, how many different ways the story can go. Um, how many like results that characters can have. Um, there's mm -hmm. a famous scene late in the game where there's like dozens of variations of this one scene just based on what characters survived, what characters you side with, who talks, mm -hmm. who's even there. Um, it's kind of crazy that, like you said, in, in 2011, they were not makers of The Witcher 3, like one of the biggest game developers uh, mm -hmm. in the industry they were just taking this insane uh, swing with this. And it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, and even just thinking about like the other games that were out around that time, like you had like the dragon age series, the Ma mass effect series. Um, yeah. Like, Skyrim came out in 2011. Um, and like a lot of those didn't even really touch like the narrative complexity and stuff that the Witcher 
two had you know yeah. like obviously they they did a lot of other things probably better than the witcher 2 but like i think for me this was definitely kind of like that first game where it was like oh man like this is a really complex like story where my choices feel like they're mattering you know mm -hmm. like i had played mass effect and obviously like those choices to me felt like they mattered and everything um and the original like dragon age but like outside of like bioware games like a lot of it was kind of just like i don't i don't necessarily see my choices impacting the narrative of the story as much as it's just kind of like skyrim you know like oh yeah i'm in charge of the you know rogues the thieves guild the the <laughs> companions the mages like i'm everything yeah. like you know mm -hmm. um whereas like a game like the witcher 2 is like no you're gonna pick one and you're you're that's your path <laughs> like you mm -hmm. can pick one side and that's it and that was a really cool like concept for me back in the day yep so uh, what do you guys say we take a little music break and then when we come back, we're going to kind of set up that story and talk about the world of The Witcher and all of that stuff. So in The Witcher 2, uh, you play as the series protagonist Geralt of Rivia, who is a, a witcher. If you're not familiar, uh, witchers in this world are professional monster hunters uh, who kind of just travel around taking on contracts, killing whatever monsters are bugging uh, the cities that they, they travel to. Um, uh, witchers have kind of magic abilities due to uh, these mutations that they've undergone to give them kind of superhuman abilities uh, to the point where they're... They don't really count as humans in the world of The Witcher because they're they're just they're different now. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to just kind of camp out here a little bit because the three of us are all Witcher fans, and uh, this is kind of an earlier look at the world that would be blown up in The Witcher Three. But I want to just talk about the world of The Witcher and what makes it so appealing. Well, if you want the most accurate portrayal you can find of the Witchers and their powers, watch the animated Vesemir movie on Netflix. That'll give you <laughs> all that you need. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. But yeah, the world and like the Witcher profession and all of that was pretty much what like cinched this for me as being one of my favorite worlds and one of my yeah. favorite franchises. It was such a cool concept that, you know, they would take these these boys and they were basically either taken as a reward for killing a monster or they were just given up by their parents. So they're kind of like the outcasts of society. And then they put them just through hell. They put their, put their bodies through something called the trial of the grasses, which only like one or two out of 10 survive. And then mm -hmm. they just rigorously train for their entire lives so that they can fight these like otherworldly monsters that kind of, showed up during the conjunction of the spheres you know all this big <laughs> lore and, and stuff to why the world is the way it is but mm -hmm. then they just kind of become the ultimate badass they kind of become like this world's batman or something like they just no bs they're and and i also what i really liked about it outside of them just being really cool was their attitudes towards their position in the world it's like this is my job it's a profession yeah, mm -hmm. I understand that your entire village, like your children are getting dragged away at night and they're getting killed by this monster or whatever, but you're still going to pay me what I'm asking or I'm not going to deal with it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and that was so unique for me where it, coming from like Lord of the Rings or some of the other fantasy things that I was into at the time where it was like, I will help you because you are on, are in need and I am the hero of this story, you know, that kind of right. thing. Where in this well, you're <laughs> like, I'm going to do it for gold or I'm leaving. Yeah, well, like, Bruce Wayne is a fucking billionaire. Like, witchers have a hard life. Like, yeah. they're <laughs> just traveling from town to town, taking contracts, basically, whatever they can find to uh, to make enough money. Um, so just a little world set up here before we continue the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. This is set in uh, a fictional world. It's got, you know, warring kingdoms and political intrigue and all of that. Um, at the At its best, I think that witcher politics can be pretty interesting um maybe like almost 
to the enjoyment I would get from a Game of Thrones type like politics mm-hmm. and stuff. It never quite reaches those heights, but it still can be interesting. Um, but on top of this, you also have the addition of all of these monsters and superstitions and curses and stuff from a uh, European and specifically Eastern European uh, folklore and fairy tales and stuff like that. And then you have magic and you have alchemy and all of these other magical things too. So like all of these things put together uh, creates a world with like, uh, I mean, if you have good writers, basically infinite possibility for storytelling, I think Mm -hmm. like cool monster stories and political drama and all of this stuff. Uh, So it's really cool um, in that way. Another thing I really like about this, we explained how witchers are basically superheroes, but a nice little wrinkle that they throw on it is that most people in the world are either afraid of or downright hate witchers. Mm -hmm. And they're Mm -hmm. like, but probably like, it's not wise to be like this, but they're assholes to witchers. They don't want them (laughs) in their town. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, you know, you've got like a very uneducated population you're dealing with most of the time, right? It's peasants most of the time. And you're kind of like in this weird position where like when you're playing as Geralt, or when you watch the show or whatever, read the books, Geralt's going from town to town. Everyone knows that he's a badass, but they mm-hmm. don't like him because he's magical. He's had these things done to him, and all witchers are like that. And it sets up just a, a cool kind of dynamic between witchers and the rest of the world, basically. Yeah, it's it's definitely a very like interesting like look at just kind of like this sort of, like you said, kind of the medieval historic type of setting but it's you know like but to me this very much feels much more like what if we took like what we know as the middle ages but we introduced all this other weird stuff to it yeah versus like you know like a lord of the rings or something where it's like oh no like this world is like magical like they're like they're elves they're hobbits they're whatever like this Mm -hmm. is like what if it was just like the human world and then out of like a random fluke monsters elves and dwarves and stuff like we're also here um i i know technically like i think the humans came over in the like whatever (laughs) in the story yeah Yeah. so but yeah it, it was a very interesting like look at just kind of like so many of the the people are just like uh this is different than me i don't want it around even though like the witchers are here help like it, it's it's interesting to watch so many of the people in this game act against their own self-interest because they're uh-huh. like hey <laughs> like there's a werewolf in the woods killing my you know these children or whatever uh you're I hate you though. Yeah, I hate but also you. fuck you, even though <laughs> yeah. you're the only person that can help me. Yeah. yeah, like I'm not going out and hunting this werewolf. I've just accepted my fate, and we're just gonna be living here. And you know, every three weeks, a child will get eaten by a werewolf. Like that's yeah. just what what we're gonna <laughs> do. Um, and it's just like, man, like that sucks. Like this world sucks, kind of. Like it, it's oh, very yeah. interesting, but it it's one of the <laughs> fantasy worlds that i'm like yeah i would not want to live here i would not want anything to do with this one absolutely not this would be down on the list of uh fantasy worlds or video game worlds that i would want to live in nope and i think that's something that the witcher 2 does like really well is kind of focus in on that like local level of the world Mm -hmm. because in Mm -hmm. the witcher 3 it focuses so much on siri and her power which even for this world is like extra it's like super special and yeah. so you're dealing with a lot of that stuff and with Geralt and like his core family and like what's going on with them. But in this game, especially with them doing the whole like amnesia thing, you really just kind of get to experience a little bit more of the day to day life of the people. You get to experience the day to day life of the peasants, of the the non-humans, of the mages. You see you kind of interact. I wouldn't say you interact with more mages necessarily in Witcher in Witcher 2, but I feel like you interact with them in more personal and meaningful ways than you do in, in three outside of just like Triss, Yennefer, you know, the the main few. Uh, so you get to you get to see like the mages. You deal with way more kings, obviously, with the assassination of kings and stuff going on. And so right. 
just being able to kind of see everybody in this world and their walks of life and what's going on politically and all that. I think that's what's really interesting about this game, especially when comparing it to like the story of the third one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the this game kind of moves from these grand like castle settings to like the first chapter, the first like meaty chapter of the game takes place in this fucking shitty swamp town. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's just like happens to be there because it's where a couple of rivers uh intersect. Other than that, it is a shitty town in a shitty swamp. And you spend a lot of time there. So you'll see that, you'll see the lives of kings and basically everything in between. Mm-hmm. So let's uh let's set up this story. So we mentioned that opening cinematic. This is again, this is in the main menu before you even start the game. There is a party on a boat and there's an assassin that goes on the boat, uh, throws a magical bomb that freezes everybody, which is super cool. Uh, and then he runs up and assassinates the king. And it's it's for an Xbox 360 cutscene looks mm-hmm. incredible. I still think it looks awesome mm-hmm. um, yeah. to this day. And, you know, I'm playing Final Fantasy 16 right now, which has mm-hmm. some of the best cutscenes I've ever seen. This one still <laughs> looks awesome, even all this time later. So, like, the story itself begins with Geralt. Uh, who is imprisoned, and he's still recovering his memories. This was one of the main plots in the first Witcher game, is that Geralt wakes up and has no idea what's going on at all. Mm -hmm. And in this game, you are going to continue recovering his memories and find out why he was that way at the beginning of The Witcher 1. Geralt is accused of murdering a different king named Foltest, um, and then you go into this prologue chapter, which yeah. it's pretty short. So I'm just going to, we'll talk about what happens in this prologue. And I think King Foltest is the king from the first Witcher game. Like, I think, is he the king? Yeah. I think you save his daughter in the first Witcher game. Um, okay. So it's also a story from the, the books and it was in, I think, season one of the show. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty famous Witcher story. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you kind of play through this tutorial that teaches you how to play the game. Um, It's an extended tutorial. There's like a tutorial tutorial at the beginning where you're in this arena (laughs) and it's fucking terrible. It's one of the worst (laughs) tutorials I've ever played. Yes. But you play through this kind of story tutorial and it it switches between Geralt in prison and going around with Foltest on the day that he dies. You can do these in any order, which is kind of cool. Just kind of Mm -hmm. pick which ones you want to explore. Um, and this kind of introduces one of the things that this this game started to feel like a bigger game, uh, which is um, a bunch of set pieces, which mm-hmm. this opening chapter where you're in this castle with full test is full of them. Yeah. It also, it, the person interrogating you or interviewing you is Roach, who is like obviously going to be a major player in the story. And in The Witcher, if if anyone's listening and you played The Witcher 3, you may have worked with Vernon Roach throughout that story. Um, he's a major player in this story as well. So in this prologue chapter, um, you meet a lot of the major players. You also meet uh, Triss Marigold, who is a, a sorceress who has a, a romantic history with Geralt, but also a kind of a work partnership from time to time. Uh, Yennefer is nowhere to be found. <laughs> um, uh, mm-hmm. You actually learn that she supposedly died and yeah, so you help the king out with this siege to regain his uh, his land. You kind of play through the battle. You help them win a fucking dragon attacks. You know, one of those mm-hmm. set pieces I, I brought up. And then at the end, the same assassin from the main menu cutscene jumps in and kills that king while Geralt is, uh, you know, classic story thing. All the guards mm-hmm. rush in and Geralt's holding him as he dies. And they're all like, you killed the king. Mm-hmm. And yep. Geralt doesn't really, he jumps out a window. That's how he escapes that. Or they catch him. No, the the assassin jumps out the window. Yeah. 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 So I was thinking of uh, like a dragon Ishin where he jumps mm. down a waterfall yep. to get away from that exact same situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's definitely like one of those things where they run in and it's just kind of like, why would I still be here if I killed this guy? Exactly. Like, why would yeah. I be holding him? <laughs> like, come on, guys. Again, Granted, yeah. It's middle-aged peasants that exactly yeah can't read and you know yeah there's also a a major choice in this prologue that you can either if you like you played on pc dave so if you tr- do whatever the process is to like carry your save over that 
choice yeah. will carry over to The Witcher 3, or you just answer the question when you're getting shaved or whatever in, in the console yeah. version. So this yeah. is like one of those, there's a handful of choices from this game that will affect certain things in The Witcher 3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, it kind of introduces you to those those branching path situations. And mm -hmm. the uh, one of the choices in this prologue is they kind of ask you like, are you you get the choice there's kind of a a lord who's on the opposing side and you get the choice to either go kill him or spare him and it mm. seems like a pretty innocuous choice but there are a lot of like ways that the story can subtly change like different people will, will be in different scenes later depending on what you do uh, mm. this is a fairly minor one as far as that goes but it kind of introduces you to how complex the story can get mm -hmm. So you have these kind of four plots that you're following throughout The Witcher 2. Uh, the first one is you have to find this person that actually killed the kings because now everyone thinks Geralt did it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's you're in prison at the beginning of the game because they think you killed the kings. Um, another plot is following and helping Triss, uh, mm -hmm. which is cool because when I played The Witcher 3, I was team Yennefer, and so I did most of the story with her. And it was cool getting to see Triss's character because you don't have a choice in this game. Triss is going to be there. So it's yeah. cool to see her get some uh, time as like a, a co-star in this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely affects the if you like if you play The Witcher 2 like I did and that was your your starting point in the universe, you're 100 percent going to be Team Triss when you get to Witcher 3. Like the only reason yeah. I have ever done Yennefer playthroughs is because I've read the books and I've you know, I've expanded right. beyond the games but mm -hmm. Triss is so great in this game and if you follow her path if you choose her as like your you know your romantic partner in three she's great in that game as well and so it's it's definitely CDPR seemed to have a favorite <laughs> when they were making yeah. these games yeah well and, and like you said you know like uh if you start with this game and Triss is there and like I went back to The Witcher 1 and Triss is in like the opening cutscene of The Witcher 1 and everything too and then you go to Witcher 3 like you said Dave earlier in the the thing it's like you like Jennifer is supposedly dead and so then I I start up Witcher 3 and like this is before I looked into like a lot of the context surrounding it uh, because mm -hmm. there is a lot that they pull from the books and the lore just of the greater Witcher universe that contextualizes a lot of stuff um but i was like man this girl like supposedly she loves me but like she's apparently been alive and hasn't bothered to try to like contact me at all so well yeah, but, yeah. gerald even brings that up he's like you didn't even try to find <laughs> me they they do pull a lot of stuff from the greater witcher lore but ironically it's not really triss in the books that he has like the affair with i it really does feel like cd project liked the character and they were yeah. like, we're going to make her a star in our games. Yeah. Yennefer is definitely the one in the books mm -hmm. and the show and then yeah. in The Witcher 3, whereas like this game is like, it's Triss. Yeah. Well, it's and it's an inter like this game exists. These games really, I guess I should say, exist in like this weird liminal space where it's like the books exist. And the game picks up after the books, but they have to be kind of creative with how they do that. Uh, at least from what Andrew has told me, because like the books kind of have a definitive end. Mm -hmm. um, and so like in some ways, the games are like rehashing parts of the book that happened, but also are taking place after the books have happened. So it's it's this weird like what parts are. I don't know. For me, it was very confusing <laughs> personally. So, yeah, I, I would personally like I read the first Witcher book. I didn't start the second one yet. I watched the first season of the show, um, a watched a little bit of the second season and stopped. Um, <laughs> so to, that's, yeah, that's putting it nicely. Um, to, to me, like the games feel separate from the books, mm -hmm. uh, which the TV show and the books are a lot more connected uh, from mm -hmm. at least what I watched and read. At least the first season. Yeah, the, and the first, first season. Season one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, as far as I got into it. Mm -hmm. But the, the games kind of feel separate to me. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I feel like if you were going to try to like place them all together in their correct spot, it might drive you crazy a little bit. 
Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's like the games are like a prologue to the books. Like they they take place after they kind of they write Geralt and Yennefer like back into the world and everything. And then they pick up and go from there. Uh, And Mm -hmm. especially three ties in with like Geralt, Yennefer and Ciri, like their core little family that all very Mm -hmm. much kind of ties back to the books and kind of like gives them potentially a happier ending depending on the choices you make. Um, but yeah, two, two very much, they used a lot of, well, they used one main trope to kind of tell their own story and that's the amnesia. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another kind of like subplot that you'll be working through as you go through the game. Geralt slowly uncovers his memories, uh, Mm. trying to figure out, you know, where is Yennefer? Is she dead? Uh, what happened? And, um, I, I, without spoiling it, I do think the the things that you learn throughout that subplot are pretty cool. Like mm-hmm. amnesiac characters, you know, it's can, can be kind of hit and miss. Like, why are they amnesiac? Are they amnesiac mm-hmm. as a way to help me learn about this world? But the reason why Geralt is in The Witcher One and Two turns out to be pretty fucking cool. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it works for me. Yeah. Like it. it- at the time I appreciated it because like you said, it was kind of pulling double duty of like, I know nothing about this world. Like it wasn't like I was coming (laughs) in and playing like a star Wars game or a, you know, Lord of the Rings game or something where I had a pre-existing knowledge of the world. And I could be Mm -hmm. like, it was like, you know, the, the memes of like where they're just like spouting off random people and places and, and concepts. And you're like, I don't know what's going on. Like that was me playing this game and so i appreciated the amnesia pulling the double duty and like explaining things to me because it was a convenient way to do that but like you said at the same time there's actually like a good reason it's not just like because it would make it easier to explain this to a player it's like there is a real good reason for him to be an amnesiac and like he's an amnesiac so like people have to like reintroduce themselves to him but Mm -hmm. it's not to the point where they're like Geralt, this is how money works. And like, (laughs) Geralt, this is what this city is and stuff. There's a lot of people that'll meet and be like, Geralt. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. And they'll have to explain. And that helps you as the player meet these new people. But it's, it's, Mm -hmm. no one has to teach him how to be a witcher. He still remembers how to do that. So Mm -hmm. like that, all that cool stuff, like no one has to be like, Geralt, these are the four different types of vampires and how you fight them and all of that. (laughs) Like, they don't have to do any of that shit. So it's kind of like this nice mm. middle ground there, I think. Yeah, he just lost some he lost his memories. He didn't really forget like who he, he's still the same person, but he just yeah. he can't remember what happened between well, I guess I'm not sure if there's a gap where he can remember, but yeah, he, he can't remember anything important. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and and it, they do a lot of like cool things in the game like that I was starting to get into even just like replaying it where it's like as he kills certain types of monsters, he's kind of like jogging his memory and learning exactly. more about like the weaknesses and stuff. And so it's like, Oh, there's, they like build that so well into just the gameplay of like, Oh, okay. I'm remembering this stuff. I'm getting back in the swing of things. I'm, I'm getting the hang of this. Hey, vampires are, are not so great against like this specific type of bomb. So like, let me start using that or whatever. Yeah, that is a nice, um, there's a lot of, like nice diegetic storytelling things in Witcher games in general. Like even the reason why you're doing what you're doing is done really well in Witcher games. Like Mm -hmm. why am I taking these side quests to go kill monsters? It's because it's my job. Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's not weird for Geralt to be doing these things. Like it might be weird for Shepard in Mass Effect to take Mm -hmm. some weird side errand or something like that. This Geralt has to do this. It's it's his job. Mm -hmm. So The last kind of like subplot that you're working through is there is like a political plot that you're working through in the game. And this is where the story really branches out. And I want to kind of Mm -hmm. talk about like expand on what we mean when we say this game has choices. This game doesn't have like get to the end of a quest, decide whether to kill or spare people. Even though I said in the prologue, there is one of those choices. Mm -hmm. Most of the choices here are not like that. Um, Mm -hmm. They are literally... Who do you choose to help? Which side do you take? You know, do you choose to uh, kill this person because you think they're evil or do you choose to spare them and like help some other people instead? You'll Mm -hmm. get lots of those like kind of gray choices. Um, And it's something that I think the Witcher 
three also did really well. But the mm-hmm. difference is that these choices and branching paths get so complicated in this game that, like I said, Joseph Anderson's video was like six hours long trying to explain all the different ways it can go. Mm-hmm. And there are like over a dozen outcomes based on all the choices you make. And I think that like this game, we'll get into this in the spoiler section, of course, but like the way that your story goes in The Witcher 2 really feels like your story. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas um, in a lot of other games that have branching paths, um, it might just be like everyone has the same story and then you get one of three different endings at the end mm-hmm. based on your morality or something like that. Like this game is not like that. But I think you you hit the nail on the head too of like they're not just choices where it's like this one is clearly like I I guess I'm thinking of like Knights of the Old Republic where it's like this one is clearly like the good Jedi version and this one is clearly the Sith version like like you said it does so well and The Witcher 3 like you said does this very well too Uh, but it's like every single choice is like I can see both sides of it and there's not necessarily like a clear one, which I think makes for a much more interesting story. And it makes it feel so much more like your own, like you were saying, because it's like, it's one of those where I'd love to see kind of like the end where it's like a telltale game where it's like so many people pick this one versus this one Mm -hmm. or whatever, because I feel like this one would be a lot more evenly split because there are good reasons to pick either for the most part. Um, Yeah. And and so rather than just like doing the oh, I'm only picking the good options or I'm only picking the bad options version of a playthrough, it's like there is a lot more nuance to it. Part of that nuance also is the fact that you're not really playing you in these games. You're you're playing as an established character who has mm-hmm. kind of like you can make the choice, of course, but like I find myself in these games like because I really like Geralt as a character. Mm -hmm. So I find myself making choices that feel like the choice that Geralt would make and not necessarily like the choice that like Geralt would say, no, fuck that. I'm not like going to go save that guy. Like I'm going to save these people instead. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or sometimes Geralt would be like, you know what? I'm not getting involved with this. Like go fuck yourself. Uh, Which is not always the choice that I would make in a lot of other games because I might, you know, make that choice to just see as much content as possible basically Mm -hmm. where like uh, if i go help them i'll get to see another level or fight a a monster or something like that whereas in the witcher it's easy to role play as Geralt, i think because you you know him Mm -hmm. yeah they do a good job of establishing him as a character but also yeah letting you kind of shape him but you do get the vibes or the feeling even even if you're not super familiar with the world that this guy would probably pick this choice so As I said at the beginning, you need probably two playthroughs to see the full picture or just watch one of those comprehensive YouTube videos. (laughs) Um, And the reason for this is that not only does the story go a different way, you'll see the story through different characters' perspectives and stuff, but you will see entire chapters from a different perspective, like specifically the middle of the big three chapters in this game your location is totally different depending on what side you pick. So the way that I took it, I saw this entire city. I had a bunch of these side quests in this city. I got to hang out with the dwarves, Mm -hmm. do a bunch of stuff like that. Whereas if I had chosen the other side, you don't even, you don't even go to that city until like the end of the chapter. So like, you're going to miss all those side quests. You're going to miss all those characters. And so when I, this really does feel like a game where if you want to see everything, you got to do two playthroughs, pick the other side, and um, you'll... I mean, there's entire stuff from, like, probably half of the game's playtime that I have no idea what happens, uh, other Mm -hmm. than, you know, kind of like watching a YouTube video breakdown and kind of in one ear and out the other as those go, you know. But Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, to, to play an experience, you do need to play it twice. Yeah. And that's really cool, like, the fact that uh, this game developer, right? They're spending mm-hmm. a bunch of money, a bunch of resources, a bunch of time building out these two halves of this story that, you know, most people don't even finish games that they mm-hmm. play, but m- most people are definitely not going to play this game two times to see everything yeah. that they made. 
So it's a really confident move by them to be like, you know what? Most people are going to see half of this. You worked really hard on this, these side quests, but half the people aren't going to see it at all. Well, and, and like we touched on already too, of like both sides feel feasible for Geralt to pick. It's not yeah. like, oh, this one is clearly the one Geralt. Like I know which one the Geralt that I know would pick, but it, it's very, it's, you can see him picking both and then both open up kind of like a side where it's like, yes, I can see him doing all of this stuff too. Uh, one other thing to mention about the uh, story stuff before we get into talking about the other stuff uh, in the episode here is the side quests were one of the things that I loved about The Witcher 3, um, how side quests would start out feeling like you know what's going to happen. Like they'll say, go over here, we've got a werewolf, come over, kill mm -hmm. this werewolf, and that'll be the end of the side quest. And I'll be like, okay, cool, I, I'll go kill the werewolf because that's how these things work in video games. And then you get into the quest and that's not how things play out. It seemed like they always had a surprise for you. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this game does that pretty well. Like, it doesn't reach like the super memorable side quest heights that The Witcher 3 had, I don't think. But I did think that the writing, the choices... Uh, the world building, uh, meeting different characters that you do get from these side quests were uh, really good. So I did find myself basically collecting and clearing all the side quests I could. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think I ever left like a a like chapter without having basically cleared everything, except mm -hmm. maybe I think there was one where some guy wanted you to collect a bunch of harpy feathers. I don't know that I finished that. One. <laughs> so. Uh, but you do end up killing a fuck ton of harpies in this game, so you probably could have <laughs> completed it just by just by doing the rest of the game. <laughs> yeah, it does kind of feel like maybe some of the um, what you're doing on the quests maybe wasn't as interesting, obviously, as what they would come to do in The Witcher Three. But it, it still had this the same the way it was delivered, the characters giving it to you, the the interactions you have when you find whatever the monster is like you're you're going to hunt something but then it turns out that thing is sentient it's not actually really hurting people and you know like mm -hmm. all that stuff was mm -hmm. was here in this game and all they really did in the witcher 3 was just blow it out refine it and do way more of it mm -hmm. yeah so these are good uh good side quests i recommend people do them um aside from the you know the material gain you'll get from them uh, getting money and experience points and stuff. Um, I, I mm -hmm. think the storytelling in them is still good here. So uh, we mentioned that opening cinematic at the beginning and how good that cutscene looked. What do you guys think about the the look of the general game outside of the cutscenes? I think it's a twofold answer uh, because for me, I'm trying to like it's hard to remember going back eleven years, twelve years mm -hmm. at this point and be or uh, I guess it wasn't quite that long for me, but like the game came out in 2011, but I still played it in like the mid 2010s. And I feel like at the time, I thought it looked really good and, you know, was very impressive, just like the the level of detail. Mm -hmm. And to an extent, like, I still think like, oh, yeah, like I like looking at it as a product of its time, I still think that. But obviously, we've gotten a little spoiled uh, over the years. And, yeah. you know, like you said, you're playing Final Fantasy 16, a game that looks like a CGI movie. Um, and so it's like, yeah, like it it looks dated now and like there's definitely some like characters that are talking or like kind of weird animations weird movements which like at the time was just kind of i think the norm like that's what i'm remembering yeah. but now it's like yeah obviously we've seen the witcher 3 and so many games up besides it that have done this so much better but i think at the time i thought it was really cool so what about you andrew 
Yeah, I think this game has a really good like art direction and a good like art style that has aged pretty well. It really is mm-hmm. mostly like the character models that have kind of aged poorly. <laughs> I think the world and a lot of this stuff, like the clothing and, and things like that, that all still looks pretty good. It's just, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's like facial animations and stuff like that. I, I watched a YouTube video prepping for this that was the original version of the game was what they captured. Mm-hmm. It it wasn't the like enhanced edition and it, mm-hmm. it looked, it looked pretty rough, but again, that's basing it off today's standard. You got to kind of put yourselves in the shoes of like, okay, dark souls one, not the, uh, not the remaster dark souls one came out then Skyrim, <laughs> the original mm-hmm. Skyrim, not the remasters. Like you got to kind of remember mm-hmm. what else was contemporary. I mean, there's a reason that, a couple years later, The Last of Us came out and just looked like people were blown away by how that game looked. And so mm-hmm. it was, I think, I think for the time, nothing stood out to me as like bad. Like I thought this is a good looking game. I don't really remember being like, wow, this is one of the best games I've ever seen. And I think parts mm-hmm. of it have aged really well, like the color palette and the style and the like art direction of the world. But yeah. then obviously, like you mentioned, the facial animations and some of the like movements and stuff like that. I mean... There's not much you can do about that it's outside of fully remaking it or something like that's just where games were at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And this this is kind of like broken out of the the era of video games that were all like various shades of gray and brown. Basically, this is a really colorful yeah. game. So I'm glad yes. you mentioned the color palette, uh, Andrew. The This game has a at least really nice like sky boxes and stuff that opening prologue when you're you're in the mid you're on one side of this big battle and you look out Mm -hmm. in the distance and you see another army over there with their you know their catapults and shit it's really impressive um the first chapter the first big chapter like i said takes place in this you know shitty swamp town and it looks grimy and dirty it looks uh looks how it should and then Mm -hmm. you go out into this forest and the forest is like thick and oppressive um, it's, it, you know, pretty good looking game, I think for this time. The other thing I want to point out is that, uh, Geralt got a glow up from the Witcher one, and then mm-hmm. he got another glow up <laughs> between this game and the Witcher three. So that was yeah. kind of rough to, yeah. uh, or a bit of a, a shock to go back to, <laughs> you know, cause I've spent like 150 hours in the Witcher three and then to go back mm-hmm. and see Geralt in the Witcher two, I was like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> they, uh, they spent some time in the lab in between these games. Um, yes he's not quite like the monster he looks like in the witcher one but Mm -hmm. (laughs) now they put more way more time effort and resources into animating the uh the female bodies and faces than they did yeah uh Geralt poor Geralt Mm -hmm. yeah um speaking of Geralt Geralt is voiced in this game uh once again by Doug Cockle the voice uh the famous voice um Mm -hmm. I think that all the voice acting in this game is pretty good the dwarves especially were were real fun to hang out with but everyone did a really good job all the main players uh even you know townsfolk the troll you meet everyone sounds good as far as i'm concerned mm-hmm. uh, i had an issue where uh because Geralt's voice is is much more like reserved than the rest of the there's a lot of like brash like yelling people in witcher games like drunk yeah. people and shit right uh Geralt's very calm and so his mm-hmm. voice like fades into the mix a little bit too much and he was really hard to understand and this game doesn't have um at least if i remember right i had to turn on the subtitles uh Mm -hmm, specifically for Geralt. i could hear everyone else loud and clear (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and talking about his glow up i think the voice acting also for doug cockle specifically he got a bit of he got a bit more consistent in the witcher 3 like there are parts Mm -hmm. of like replaying and rewatching this game where it was like He's kind of slipping in and out of the gruffness a bit here and there, but overall, like I think he still did a really good job. But you can tell that in The Witcher Three, he like really nailed it. So uh, let's get into the gameplay. 
of The Witcher 2. Uh, so the gameplay is third person um, action in quotation marks combat. <laughs> um, and it's got a really kind of distinct, all the Witcher games have a really distinct rhythm to the combat, mm. I think. But before we get into, you know, how this game feels, uh, you have your standard light attack, heavy attack, and you have your five magic spells called signs. The signs are really basic. You know, you can shoot fire. You can put down like a ward that hurts ghosts. Uh, you can do a Jedi mind trick on people. Uh, you have a shield and there's like a force blast. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the five. Um, also in this game, though, they really made a big deal in the tutorial about things like throwing bombs, throwing knives and setting traps, which is yeah. the, the one they didn't keep for The Witcher 3. Uh, mm -hmm. bombs and knives and potions and stuff that all stayed uh to, did, when you guys played do you really mess around with you know these sub weapons a little bit um i think it really depended on like if i was having difficulty with the combat or not uh -huh. like if i died uh to something then it's like okay let me look at like trying to use some of these things uh to to get the edge but i think for the most part i was kind of just like if i can kill it with just my light and heavy attacks and the signs like that's probably what because like you have to like hold down a button and like go into a sub menu to like equip the thing and then like mm -hmm. uh, to me it felt kind of awkward to do more than just like attack with your swords and use like one uh either like magic or a bomb or a knight like because i think it's mapped to like left trigger or left bumper or something to to just throw whatever you have in that slot yeah so, and the, it's the cumbersome signs, for sure yeah the signs yeah i didn't really mess with it yeah the the magic you use that you know it, it's yeah, fun mm -hmm. to shoot fire at enemies or put up a shield or mm -hmm. something like that so i used lots of uh the signs and there's a lot of enemies that are really really difficult if you don't use the magic because they're all weak to something something is yeah. gonna help you fight them um but yeah i didn't really fuck with uh with traps or knives at all and like you said dylan if an enemy is giving me trouble, I'd be like, okay, do I have a bomb that I can throw? Or if there's like, yeah. cause sometimes you'll get into a situation. There's like, there's like 19, uh, yeah. fucking necrophages. And I'm like, okay, I'll throw a bomb and try and clear some of these out. Yeah. Well, and I think too, some of that is dependent on like the skill tree. Um, like I, I know yeah. I spec very heavily into just like the combat side of the skill tree and you don't mm -hmm. real you don't really get enough points to like spread them out amongst different trees. Like if you get all of the skill points available, uh, like you can kind of max out one tree or like at, at a certain point, I remember there being like you, you hit like a, a special move or like an adrenaline thing or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you don't have enough to like get two of those from what I remember. Um, yeah. and so, it heavily encourages you to kind of just pick one play style and do it. And to me, the swords were the way to go personally. So, yep. Agreed. How about you, Andrew? Yeah. I like botched the crappy tutorial that we talked about earlier and it was like, you're playing on easy. And I was like, all right, I'm playing on easy. And so I just, me too. <laughs> swords yep. and stuff were, were enough for me. Um, Obviously, signs like I always like to throw up a shield or something and like, you know, fire can be helpful. Like you mentioned, certain enemies might have certain weaknesses. But yeah, the the tool kit felt I mean, it, it still feels a little clunky in The Witcher 3, but it felt really clunky in this game. And so I just didn't really mm -hmm. engage with it. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think about the overall like sword combat, too, before we kind of get into the the nitty gritty of of witchering in this game? Whew. I'm trying to think of what I thought about it at the time because I don't want to just like go off of my most recent like attempts in the past couple months because uh -huh. my most re <laughs> like we live in a, like a post Elden Ring post like I've played all of the From Software games like world and so like going back I was like who this combat is rough uh it it feels very floaty it feels like sometime like i don't understand sometimes like why i'm getting hit or why i'm doing yes more damage or less damage uh that sort of thing uh it just didn't feel as like refined uh and like 
I enjoyed the combat in The Witcher 3. It wasn't my favorite part of that game, but like it felt so much better in 3. I'm trying to remember, though, at the time, I don't know that I had as big of a problem with it, but also I hadn't played Dark Souls. I hadn't played like so many of these other games that have shown me better combat. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like it does. I would say it doesn't necessarily really hold up to today's standards. And unless you're just trying to be a completionist and get all the achievements or something like there's no reason to play it on anything higher than normal or uh, higher than easy. <laughs> so yeah. I, agree. yeah, I thought that the, the thing I noticed going back to it was just how tanky even like a random dude was on story mode. Like I felt mm-hmm. like I'm beating on this dude with my sword for, what feels like forever before they die and and yeah then all, not to mention just like hitbox stuff and, and jank and things like that in the combat i think at the time when i played it the first time i was just like well this is just kind of how video games are like the other games i had played were like <laughs> skyrim where that's you don't play that game for the combat either you know so yeah mm-hmm. it, it just what it didn't really stand out to me as super egregious but it is hard to go back to and i mean like dylan mentioned combat's still not the best part of the witcher 3 but it is it's passable and it's a huge improvement from 2 and again i think that goes back to them making the leap to console for this game Mm -hmm. like coming from kind of that pc angle where you're just like clicking on enemies or whatever to attack them and in this game they're trying to make more of like an active action combat and it just they hadn't quite figured it out Mm -hmm. yeah so the witcher 1 was that kind of like the witcher 1 is almost like a rhythm game. Like you are kind of targeting and then tapping to like maintain a sword combo, but you're not like tapping to swing your sword. Like Geralt's like doing flips and shit during your combos in the Witcher one. It's real weird. Um, The Witcher three is action combat where like Mm -hmm. if you swing a sword and the, the sword you're holding makes contact with something, it will damage it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's not how this game works. It's that's why, like I said in the earlier part of the the episode, this feels like a half step between those two games. Yeah. So the way that this and I I agree I I hated this combat. <laughs> I, I couldn't wrap my head around it until I did some digging and um you know watched some videos and stuff that explained how this actually works, mm-hmm. and it would suddenly like made sense like oh that's why I didn't like this and. It was for the reasons you said, Dylan, it's like, there are so many times where like, I'm clearly not getting hit by an enemy, but I get, Mm -hmm. I take damage or like I'm swinging the sword and it's just not hitting them. Like not Mm -hmm. like hitting them and bouncing off because they're wearing an armor or a shield or something like swing right through them doesn't do any damage. And so it's like, why? So the reason why is that it's not animation and like, like hitbox based like you you brought up from software and like i you know i love those games too i don't think that they make like the best action combat systems but like the one thing you can say about them is uh, for the most part the hitboxes of the weapons are consistent and if you don't yeah. get hit by a weapon you don't take damage mm-hmm. and if you swing a weapon even if you're not targeting something it'll hit them hit the enemy that's not how this game works uh so you you have to target an enemy in order to do damage to them. Mm-hmm. If you don't literally like press the lock on button and then you swing your sword, it, they just won't take any damage. <laughs> if there's three dudes lined up next to each other and you're targeting the first, the one in the middle, the other two won't take damage even if your sword swings right through them, uh, mm-hmm. unless you buy that in the skill tree later. So, yeah. um, and the way that this was explained is that you have like, basically a a zone in front of you that that does damage and if an enemy's in that zone then they'll take damage Mm. and that works for enemies trying to hit you too but Mm. it's not based on whether you're in the zone when the weapon swings it's whatever frame they've deemed to be like the damage frame if you're in when that keys then you take damage so there's like so many clips of like i am like six feet away from the sword (laughs) but i'm taking damage and that's why Mm. Uh, so it just doesn't feel good. And so it's like a, it's an action combat system or sorry, it is not an action combat system that is dressed up to look like one. And mm-hmm. that's why it doesn't feel good. So, uh, I played this on easy. Um, I also like just could not beat the tutorial 
and they were like, okay, put it on easy there, champ, and let's get you on into the game. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yes, yeah. <laughs> please. Let's yeah. let's move on. Yeah, speaking of that tutorial too, I, I know yeah. we've talked about how terrible it is, but I, when I was going back and recently replaying it, like they, I did the tutorial and I did, you know, like they're they're teaching you all these different moves and things. And then mm. you start the game and you're not the same level that you were in the tutorial. So you don't have all the moves that they taught you how to do in the tutorial. So I'm yeah. sitting there trying to like parry and trying to do all these things. Yeah. And I, I'm like, why can't I do this? Am I just terrible at video games? Uh, and yes, I am. Yeah, two things can be true. <laughs> also, but also I, I, I like pulled up my skill tree and was looking at it because I'm like, am I not pressing the right button? What's how does parrying or other things work in this game? And I'm like, oh, I'm level one now. I yeah. don't have access to all these moves that I had <laughs> mm-hmm. in the tutorial. And so and they never tell you that. And it's like, well, why did you why did you do that? TV? Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. So it became like a. Well, I was playing on easy, so but it was still mm-hmm. frustrating on easy. There were some boss fights that were really difficult, even on easy mode, uh, yeah. because you just can't trust the animations and like the characters moving. Like if a character does this big shoulder bash charge at you or something, I have no idea how to safely get away <laughs> from that. And so it's just kind of like felt lucky when I did. Um, yeah. So it's it's just like people love to shit on the combat in the Witcher three, but I like the combat in the Witcher three when I played it. And so like coming back to this, I was like, Holy shit. They, you know, it's, it's not perfect in the Witcher three for sure, but they came a long way from the Witcher two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, definitely echo the recommendation to play this on easy mode for anyone out there who's considering playing this. Yeah. Well, and they had like a bunch of like QTEs and stuff like quick time events in this game um that would like pop up randomly like during combat and like failing them either seriously hurt you or just straight up killed you uh Mm -hmm. and so like you could you could play the game well up until that point and then if you missed a button press it's like oh now this k-rin has destroyed you or whatever i'm glad you said the k-rin because i was thinking like i'm remembering in my head all of these like cool action set piece moments that I fucked up like 10 times each. Cause I didn't know what the game wanted me to do during. <laughs> yep. Them. Yeah. Yep. So the other part of uh witcher combat and witchering is combat prep, which is mm-hmm. one of I, th- in my opinion, one of the coolest things about these games is say you get a contract to go kill a vampire. Well, if you just go fight a vampire straight up, it's going to be really hard. Mm-hmm. Even on easy mode, it could be really hard. So what you need to do is you need to learn about vampires and find out what they're weak to. You need to brew potions to give Geralt, you know, maybe health regen or uh, can see in the dark, lots Mm -hmm. of different potion effects. Um, You need to create oils to put on your sword that a particular monster might be weak to. Maybe they're weak to a particular kind of bomb. You need to make that bomb uh, to prepare for combat. Uh, This is why The Witcher 3 is one of the only games that I will play on a higher difficulty because I dig this so much. Yeah. In this game, it's like almost there. It's just not quite. Yeah. I didn't have as much fun doing it in this game. Um, One of the big reasons is that potions suck ass (laughs) in this game. Yeah. Yeah. They they come with a lot more downsides in this game. And a lot of times, unless you know what's coming, like it just kind of throws you into a fight. Uh-huh. And so if you haven't pre prepped, like you can't you can't like drink potions or put oils on your sword during the fight, I don't think. And so yeah. it's like, oh, OK, like I need to actually like on the one hand, it is much more of like, oh, you're prepping for this. On the other hand, it sucks because they, they just throw you into some of these fights and you're like, ah, well, I didn't know this was coming. I thought I would have a chance to meditate and do this stuff. <laughs> yeah. That that Karen fight, um it's an early game boss fight, but like it's a perfect example of this. So there's some potions that can help you in that fight, but potions last uh like they don't last very long. They're like a couple minutes. Mm. So that fight has a really long run up. So you think like, "Oh, the potion's going to run out before I get to the boss fight if I like drink it in town and then run up to the boss fight." So I'm going to run up next to the arena and then meditate, drink the potion, and then go in and fight. But 
the line that you step over that's like, okay, cutscene is starting, you're going into the boss fight is like way before the boss arena. <laughs> so you couldn't even do that. It's just yeah. a whole fucking mess and just like took some of the fun out of this. Um, I still mess with the oils. I still made bombs, but like I couldn't rely on it as part of the prep. And I was playing mm-hmm. on easy, so I didn't need to, but I wanted to because yeah. that's part of the role play. Right. You know, mm-hmm. another thing um, just to kind of, well, I mean, I'm kind of like shitting on the gameplay here. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> we like the game in general, yeah. I think. But yeah, it's, it's why I lot. recommend playing on easy. Like, mm-hmm. I'm I'm not going to recommend people like not play this, but I recommend playing on easy because the story is really fucking cool and you should mm-hmm. experience it if you like Witcher stuff. It's just like the going around um, exploring is generally not worth your time in this game. You're yeah. never going to find anything cool. Uh it's one of those where like they made, you know, they make like a big ass forest and then they'll make mm-hmm. like six offshoots where there's cool stuff. But only once you started the quest that will like populate the monster that's supposed to be in this corner or like right. mm-hmm. the dead body that's supposed to be in this cave or something like that. They're not there until yeah. you accept the quest. So if you go out and explore, you'll be like, oh, empty cave. Uh, there's a clearing that sure looks like they made it for something, but there's nothing there now. It's mm. uh, just not super rewarding that way. Yeah, and and even some of the like rewards, like not not that the rewards didn't ever feel worth it, but I remember there being like, and like each chapter kind of gave you more rewards that immediately kind of negated the old rewards. Uh, yeah, and so it's kind of like, oh, okay, so like. The the cool sword that I really enjoyed that I found in Act One, immediate like it's not something that you can upgrade and keep using. It's like oh well, even though you like this sword and you know the 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 things that it does, Act Two is immediately going to give you a better sword, and yeah. it's not worth not taking that one. So yep, and, and to be fair, that's that's something that is not great in The Witcher Three. Also, you're just yeah you're you're replacing your sword every 15 minutes in that game too. But Mm -hmm. yeah, but they were able to do a little bit more with, you know, especially with it being open world. But again, you mentioned like things not triggering till you've accepted the quest. Like in the Witcher Mm -hmm. three, you can just stumble upon an an event. Like you can join a quest like halfway through, or you can complete it and then go back to the town and be like, Oh yeah, I killed that thing. Can you pay me? So like they did a better job of making the world feel lived in and like Mm -hmm. real outside of you as the player whereas the witcher 2 didn't quite they didn't find that yet yeah, yeah. it's it's a little immersion breaking mm-hmm. to like you know find a cool cave or something and then you just you go and you're like oh there's there's going to be something later mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. you know <laughs> yeah it's 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 weird to call the game linear because like we've talked about there are so many like different branching paths mm-hmm. but it's like there is a very like First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. And that's like progression for like everything in the game versus Mm -hmm. like you were saying, Witcher 3, where it's kind of like they thought through like, well, how how might like a player come across this? Let's see if we can come up with all the different ways that they might come across this and come up with like something so that no matter how they discover this little thing, it makes sense and that there's some, it's not like oh i found this empty cave it's like oh i found this cave there was a thing in it and now there's new dialogue or a different way of doing this so yeah there's uh there's there's one other thing i want to bring up and it like if if you i don't know if you guys have anything to add to this uh so if not just you know just let me go here mm-hmm. but this um and i don't i i almost never talk about this on the show cuz it almost never it's almost never like super relevant to the play experience, but this game has just atrocious UI and menus. Yeah. I don't know if you guys played, you guys both said you played on 360, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Playing this with a controller is a nightmare. <laughs> you are yeah. just constantly clicking on the wrong thing. Like mm-hmm. I'll try to read a book and I'll end up unequipping my sword. <laughs> like yeah. when trying to do these completely unrelated things, Mm-hmm. I tried playing with mouse and keyboard, which I recommend to people now because it, it just sucks so bad with a controller or like if you're playing on PC, play the game with a controller and then pause mm-hmm. and use your mouse to use the menu. <laughs> it's that bad in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's also like if you're looting containers, 
say there's like a sword and then like 15 pieces of trash stuff you don't want to pick up because you have mm. uh, inventory limits in this game. Yeah, for some reason. <laughs> yeah. You, on a uh, controller, you cannot just pick up one thing from a container. You have to take everything. Mm. And if you're playing with a mouse, you can pick what you want to take out of the controller. It doesn't make any fucking sense to me. And it, it drove me crazy the entire game. Yeah. <laughs> when. And one of the videos I was watching too to like kind of re- refresh myself, they were playing on PC and they were talking about how like you can't change like once you get into the game you can't change settings or anything like you have to do it all from like the launcher or whatever of the PC, and so even that is just very much like wow that was a product of its time or maybe yeah. not even because I'm pretty sure Skyrim lets you change settings so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was um. I mean, like playing the combat, swinging the sword, dodging, mm-hmm. all of that stuff felt obviously to me as a person who played with controllers my whole life feels way better with the controller. But mm-hmm. if you're listening and you're comfortable with both mouse and keyboard and a controller for all of that stuff, play the whole thing with mouse and keyboard because, you know, the the 25th time you unequip your pants when you were trying to like drink a <laughs> potion, it's just it's going to drive you crazy. Yeah, it felt like they were going a lot more for um, like an aesthetic with their menus and stuff, like trying to make it look a certain way and like fit the world. But then they sacrificed mm-hmm. like functionality. It, it's a complex game. Like this game needs more menus than it has. There's like there's the one menu you hit like this, like kind of slow down and it pulls up like all your spells mm-hmm. and all your sub weapons and all your meditation menu all on one screen. And then there's like the other menu screen that has all your inventory and all of that stuff. And it's it's something about like, you know, the way things are highlighted or something just makes it really hard to find where you actually are in those menus. Yeah. So uh, again, pretty much fixed in The Witcher 3. The Witcher 3 has so many fucking menus, but it's a very complex game. I think it needs that many. The Witcher 3 mm-hmm. also, they did a, a huge overhaul of all the menus like post launch. I can't remember if it was like six months after or I I don't think it was quite a year, but they reworked the entire like menu system and like rearranged some stuff and changed things up. Cause even in that game, people were complaining about certain things, not functioning like they wanted them to. But like I said earlier, they had the ability to go back and fix it on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. And you, all you can do with the, uh, well, I don't know if you could put out patches. I don't know how, I don't remember how anything was in 2011 <laughs> video games or general right. life at all. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you could put out patches through Xbox live then, but you know, yeah. So uh, what do you guys say? We get into some uh, final thoughts here before we get into the spoiler talk. Sounds good. Sure. Who would you recommend the Witcher two to? <laughs> um, for me, I would recommend this game to, somebody who really loved Witcher three or maybe who has enjoyed the books or like, I don't, I feel like at this point you kind of have to be like, you really liked the third game and you want more and you want to kind of see some more of this universe, like the CDPR universe, go check out the Witcher two. Enough of it holds up that it's worth replaying. You're going to have to like struggle through a few things like we've talked about here. Anybody else, like say somebody who enjoyed the show or somebody who just read the first book or something like that, I'm probably still going to tell people to start with three because I don't Mm -hmm. want them to be turned off from like the universe by some of the like heartache in this game. But I think if you're Mm -hmm. a fan of the characters and the lore and the world and the setting and especially like the the political setting and then more of the the conflict of the world versus like Geralt and his struggle and like him trying to, you know, work things out with Yennefer and find Siri and reconnect with his daughter and all these kind of things. That's very much the story of three. And if you want to see Kings fighting and battles and po- politics and sorceresses, then two is definitely worth checking out. Yeah, I would. I don't think I really have a ton to add to that beyond just like, yeah, like it uh, just reiterating. If you really liked the Witcher game, like Witcher three, um, or you just like the Witcher in general, or if you're that 
random weird person who's only played the witcher one so far like (laughs) yeah go ahead and just play two get it over with so that you don't have to go back but yeah like it's i would say this if anything that we've kind of alluded to story wise sounds good to you like i think it's worth checking the game out if you like this universe because the story is so intricate and like it does part of the thing that I love, which is just it's throwing stuff at you constantly and is like you are existing in a world where the story is going on and you are impacting the story in ways that you don't even see as much in games now. You know, like there there definitely are games where you impact the story. But the fact that they were doing this in 2011 is crazy. Um, so like it's it's worth playing if you're into the story. Play it on easy. Don't do anything crazy. Like take kind of the advice that we've been giving for the past, you know, hour or so uh, of of like, you know, don't worry about exploring. Just pick up the quest and go do those. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. so I'd say it's worth it for that. But if not, yeah, like I, I don't know that you need to. It's not a game I would say you need to rush out and go play if it doesn't sound interesting or you're not a fan of The Witcher. Yeah, I so I agree with you for sure. Like. All of those people who have liked a Witcher thing in the past a lot, whether it be books, uh, mm-hmm. The Witcher 3, The Witcher 1, you know, the TV show, if you want Witcher story stuff that's really cool, definitely check out The Witcher 2. Play it on easy. Mm-hmm. You know, I I just like shit on basically every aspect of the gameplay in this game <laughs> for like the last 45 minutes, but let's not forget that before that i spent 45 minutes just talking sugar about how cool all the story stuff they do is Mm -hmm. in this game so like if you like the kind of stories that the witcher can tell and you like Geralt as a character of course then this game is definitely worth checking out for sure um if you i mean there's a possibility that you'll you'll drive with the combat i i personally i don't think it's very well designed at all like Mm -hmm. i once i saw how it actually works i was like oh that's explains why i hate this so much because it Mm -hmm. it kind of sucks even from that you know that in that granular detail there but you know your experience with it might be different from mine of course so like you're listening to this podcast you're obviously an intelligent and beautiful person (laughs) so you can think for yourself and form your own opinion but i definitely you know i i I would recommend the witcher one as like a almost a curiosity if you want to see the mm-hmm. beginning and if, or if you like weird old computer games that's a weird old computer game the witcher yep. one this one is more just like i think if you're in it for that story you want to see these cool branching paths and narrative stuff that they do definitely check this out but don't expect much from the gameplay especially if you're coming from the witcher 3 or if you're mm-hmm. far in the future and there's some new awesome witcher game that's out that we don't <laughs> even know about yet well there's there's a couple points piggybacking off of that that I just thought about. Like, A, it's it's an unfortunate thing that people kind of are a little bit upset about is like there's really only a handful of things from Witcher 2 that carry over into Witcher 3 in any meaningful way. So, like, mm-hmm. there's not really that reason mm-hmm. to play them in chronological order. So, you know, if you haven't played any and you're just curious, you can start with three. And then yeah. there's, you know... They've announced, and who knows if we'll ever actually see it, they're going to remake The Witcher 1. Mm, And I wouldn't be surprised to see The Witcher 2 get some sort of treatment like that at some point then, too. So it's like, you know, maybe if you're in the far future, you can just play those remakes because they're going to be a hell of a lot better. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Yeah. It's definitely at least going to make The Witcher 1 a lot easier for people to uh, to get Mm -hmm. in and jive with, for sure. Yes. Uh, So before we get into the spoiler section for The Witcher 2, I will give you guys the floor, as is custom, uh, to shill your friendly neighborhood gamers in whatever form you'd like to. Uh, Well, for for us, the easiest way for you to find us is just our website, which is effinggamers.com. Everything is there, so it's a really easy hub to find everything. Uh, If you're into podcasts, you're listening to this podcast, which means you like podcasts and you like games, which is what we do, and you know how to find podcasts. So we're all the places that you can find (laughs) Tales from the Backlog. Um, We've had Dave on our show a couple times. We've had him on our YouTube channel as well. So there's definitely some some easy entry points if you want, you know, a familiar voice there. 
Um, but that that's for the podcast. Obviously, YouTube, same thing. You just search for us. But again, mm-hmm. like all of our links, everything is all the, the the website is is it's the hub. It's you know some people use Linktree. We have our website. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, and I'll put the link to the website down in the show notes so everyone can find the podcast and the YouTube channel uh, easily. They can ignore me when I'm plugging my own stuff here in the next minute or so and just go uh, just go on uh, to the, the Your Friendly Neighborhood Gamers website. So um, for Tales from the Backlog, um, I'm going to give a big suggestion to come join the Discord server. And especially if you played The Witcher 2 and you want to talk about how your story uh, lines up with our stories, that'll be a good place to do it in the Discord server. Um, if you want to support the show, uh, ratings and reviews are a cheap and quick way, free and chick, uh, cheap way, not cheap, to support the show. Ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, and other magical platforms that allow those types of things. Uh, if you want to support monetarily, patreon.com slash Jackson. You'll get a bunch of treats uh, in return for your generous contributions. And I have another podcast called A Top 3 Podcast, where every episode is a top three list. Most of the time, sometimes we do drafts of uh, stuff that doesn't need to be drafted. (laughs) But hey, what is a podcast if not unnecessary from the beginning? So uh, that's a top three podcast. So we are going to take a break, and when we come back, it is full spoiler time for The Witcher 2. Okay, we're back and it's full spoiler time for The Witcher 2. We're going to kind of walk chronologically through the story. We're not going to hit every plot beat, but we are going to talk about kind of key moments, maybe memorable stuff, and of course, how our stories diverge. So after that prologue, you and Triss and Roach uh, go to this uh, shitty swamp town, like I said earlier. It's called Flotsam, uh, which is at like a trade crossroads. Uh, I should say before that, you break out of prison roach or someone else in there gives you a key and tells you to sneak out and it's really fucking hard Mm -hmm. to sneak out and you basically end up setting the place on fire i think i don't think you can sneak (laughs) out i think it's gonna go down poorly the one thing that can be different Mm -hmm. in that sequence is if you spared the guy on the during the battle like he'll be in there like helping you get out and then like you think he ends up dying like in an explosion but then you can find him later he's still alive yeah Mm -hmm. and if you kill him there's a woman from his family that's like being interrogated in the prison you can help her escape Mm. instead so anyway you go to um to flotsam uh which is this just awful like we we talked earlier about how like the witcher would be like a terrible world to live in Mm mm-hmm because you'd be living in a place like this. Yeah. Basically. yeah. <laughs> You're in a fucking swamp. There are elves out in the woods attacking every day. One of the thing, one of like the key kind of subplots in this area is um, it's basically like human supremacy over elves mm-hmm. and dwarves and all the other races that are living there. Uh, so you've got that whole thing going on. There's like yeah. a kraken in the river that's fucking shit up. It's just a terrible place. Yes. It's one of those things where it requires a little suspension of disbelief to just even believe that people are able to survive in this like town <laughs> yeah. because it's like, <laughs> how, how do you, I guess fishing, but even then yeah. it's like, you know, you're, you're getting killed by the Kraken thing every now and then because exactly. like everywhere outside of town, like is dangerous even for a witcher and then everything inside of town just looks terrible. So, <laughs> Yeah. This um this section in Flotsam to me felt the most like The Witcher, mm-hmm. I guess, because uh, this is when you're still you're doing the most Witcher stuff, yeah, like yeah. taking contracts to go kill monsters, um, exploring. You you're not like in the political machine 
like you are in the later chapters, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. So this has some memorable stuff, like um, the the quest where you're sent out. There's a, a troll that's supposed to be rebuilding mm-hmm. this bridge outside of town. Um, and the troll is a drunk, and so <laughs> you, he won't even talk to you until you bring him alcohol. And then it, it's this is where Witcher side quests are just better than a lot of other games side quests because mm. a lot of games would be like final fantasy 16 for fuck's sake would be like <laughs> okay you take the troll some alcohol and then he's like okay thank you i'll build the bridge now mm. uh, or you kill the troll and that's it in this game you have the choice you can kill the troll if you want to uh, you can attack him but you find out that he's not building the bridge because he's sad because his wife left or his mm. wife was um she was killed. No, his wife was killed. Yeah, she was That's murdered. Right. That was a different troll whose wife left him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> yeah. in chapter two. Um, yeah. <laughs> this one's wife uh, was killed by a bunch of humans around because humans are assholes. Mm-hmm. And you go around, you you can find out what happened. You can uh, probably kill those people if you'd like to. And mm-hmm. then you kind of work with that troll to get him back to like, okay, now I'll build the bridge. Mm-hmm. and just much more complicated than a lot of games would make this type of quest. Yeah. Yeah. Like pretty much any other game that you take a quest to like go deal with the troll. You're like, all right, I'm going to go like kill the troll and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get my reward. You're not, Mm -hmm. you're not expecting the, Oh, I'm going to go get this troll. And then it turns into like, Oh, this is way more complicated than I thought. This is way more like, there's a lot more nuance here. Yeah. And then you can ultimately find the severed head of the troll wife on the wall of the like man who killed her and take it back to the drunk troll. And mm-hmm. he, he sees it as like a, 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 a good thing, like a form of closure, but mm-hmm. it is a little bit like <laughs> a little bit bizarre that that's how far this quest can go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Witcher stories like almost never have happy endings. Right. So no. like, <laughs> even that is um kind of the happy ending for that quest. But It's just an example of, you know, uh, other parts of this game have side quests or have like the main quest is often like you'll do like one big mission, like set piece thing, and then you'll do like three smaller missions uh, and then Mm -hmm. you'll get to another like real big story set piece. And between the side quests and then those like smaller main quests, you do some pretty good witchering um, in this game. But Mm -hmm. chapter one definitely feels uh reminds me of Velen from The Witcher 3 and just what a shithole yeah. it is and how angry and depressed everybody is that lives there. Yeah. Yeah. So in that game or in chapter 1 you're introduced to this conflict uh between the people who live there um who are ruled by this uh asshole I didn't write his name down but he's he's basically like humans are the best everyone else you know dwarves and elves can fuck off and mm-hmm. then there's a rebel group of elves that live out in the forest called the scoyatel uh well those the elves are the scoyatel yeah and the group has their own name that i didn't write down again well scoyatel is like the um it means squirrels and so it's like mm-hmm. the elven like rebel fighters the ones that okay. like so they the fight in the group. woods yeah yeah so that's what scoyatel is so that's yeah that's um oh what's his name Yorvith, that's Yorvith. Yorvith and his his crew out there. They're mm-hmm. the Scoyatel. Right. So you have to kind of work with Yorvith and the Scoyatel um, in this early section in order to kind of kind of mediate a little bit, but mostly because the um, the Witcher, it turns out, that killed those kings had contact with them. And so you go out mm-hmm. and work with them. And so you're introduced to both sides, and it's setting up this choice at the end of Chapter 1 of what side you're going to take in this conflict. The elves have basically lost all of their land to the humans uh, that have come Mm -hmm. in and killed them off. Um, It's very reminiscent of natives around uh, when white people showed up. Mm -hmm. So um, there's that. And it kind of sets you up with that versus Vernon Roach, who takes the side of like the people in town um, and Vernon Roach kind of feels like your bro at this point in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, he got you out of prison. He's a semi likable guy. And so as you're working through this, you don't have to make your choice until the end of chapter one, but you're getting introduced to both sides and how like, mm-hmm. even if you don't know a choice is coming, you're kind of like, 
getting introduced to both sides of this conflict, you know? Yeah, well, and, and I think it does a good job of setting up, like, it's not just, like, an easy, like, this is the good choice, this is the bad choice, you know? Like, yeah. obviously, I think, you know, like, to me, one definitely seemed like the the lesser of two evils sort of situation, uh, you know? But, like, you're you're being introduced to, like you said, Yorvith, Yorvith who has contact with these Kingslayers and might be ordering the hits, like, you don't know at this point in the game. Um, yeah. And so it's like these people could literally be assassinating kings, uh, but also like Roach has an interest, like a decent point of like, yeah, like, but these rebels are killing just like innocent townspeople. And like, yeah. yes, they're on their land, but like they didn't know like they, you know, and so like there's this very much like n it's one it's yet another like very interesting gray choice, you know? Yeah, and both Yorvith and Roach are like patriots for their sides. So mm -hmm. they're both kind of willing to do whatever it takes to achieve the goals for their people, which, you know, Roach is fighting for Tamaria, but Tamaria always seems to be like under the boot of somebody else, and so he's always trying to to get Tamaria to to back to its like former glory or whatever, whereas mm -hmm. Yorvith, you know, he's trying to get the land back for the elves, have the elves be a bit more of the free people they once were, but especially mm -hmm. like in the books and stuff like the Scoia'tael are terrorists. Like they're, they're a yeah. nuisance. They're, they're not like they see themselves as freedom fighters, obviously, but they're, they're pretty rough with their mm -hmm. methods. Yeah. Yeah. But they set up that way in chapter one, like you're introduced to them and they're the villains when yeah. you get mm -hmm. to Flotsam. Um, you yeah. you don't see their side of things until you actually do some missions and talk to Yorvith a bunch. So like they they do an interesting job of like Roach is your bro. He helped you get out of prison. He's friendly enough. Then you're like, oh, there's this other leader named Yorvith. He's the leader of this terrorist group, like you said. And when you're presented with like the quest to go out and talk with him, everyone's like, yo, Yorvith's gonna fuck you up. Like you you can't go out. They're gonna kill you. That's what mm -hmm. they do. They kill people who go outside the town walls. So it's good storytelling how they set it up that way. And then like mm -hmm. gradually that gets chipped away until when you do have to make that choice at the end, like you said, it's not a, um, I'm going to pick the light side versus the dark side choice. Like it's a pretty reasonable choice as far as these go. I think mm -hmm. before we get to that choice though, uh, there is just a one thing we got to talk about. We talked about that Karen boss fight a yeah. little bit before, but this is notable for a few reasons. One reason is that this is a Witcher quest. Mm -hmm. They tell you the Karen is like a, a Kraken that's living in the river. Basically. Um, they tell you that you have to prepare for this thing. So you have to go learn about it. You have a lot of different ways, like depending on how your quests go, you can like if you're able to sneak behind like the, the Lord's house or whatever, you can find pieces of a trap that you can make like a special Karen trap. Um, I got caught, so I couldn't do that. Um, mm -hmm. but you do have a quest where it's like, this thing's poisonous. You have to find ingredients to make a poison, uh, a poison cure potion or whatever. Um, you have to learn about it. You have to ask people like, Hey, what's been happening when it attacks? What's it look like? And it's like the only time in this game that this, kind of quest for a boss fight happens to this scale. So it's it's kind of weird that it it it's really early in the game and then it's the only one. Like yeah. you fight a fucking dragon later in the game, you don't prepare for mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's it it feels like it was set up almost as the tutorial for like this is how every like witchering quest is going to go and then it yeah. it kind of is just like eh. <laughs> not how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, it ended up being just like one, the one slice of witchering and then you end up like thrust into the political mm -hmm. nightmare that is the rest of the game. Yeah. yeah. And the boss fight itself just sucked. I, I was just going <laughs> like, to say I remember like, that all this time later. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, the boss fight is awful. Um, so what it does is it raises up its tentacles and slams them down. Um, what you have to do is put a, a Yurden spell down where the tentacle is going to slam and then dodge out of the way. And you have to do that a bunch and you have to cut off the tentacles. The poison thing that you're supposed to prepare for is just a poison spit attack that is incredibly easy to dodge. It's <laughs> not worth the trouble of making the poison. 
Um, it's not worth the trouble of meditating to drink the poison. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then after you cut off all the tentacles, which is hard because it has all these attacks with wonky hitboxes and stuff. It's, it's just, mm-hmm. um, it's rough. There's a, a set piece where Geralt grabs onto its tentacle and it's like swinging you around and crashing into like these ruins that like fall down on top of it. And then it's like unconscious and you have to like run up and do the death blow. But it took me like 10 tries to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. What it was, I don't know if you guys remember, but like the points that you have to hit with your sword during phase one to cut off the tentacles are glowing. It's a classic video game thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. You do this uh, set piece and the, the, the K-Rin is like pinned down. You're going to run up and do the thing. It lets you off on the ground and there's a, a glowing spot right ahead mm-hmm. of you. And so you run up to go hit it and it's it's actually an electric field that kills you the second you touch it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. What you have to do is go around the side and run up the ruins and jump off. Oh, which yeah. has never been a thing that you've had to do in the game up until that point. It's, <laughs> it's just a very frustrating uh, thing. But the... Yeah. The spectacle of this monster like swinging you around and crashing into the ruins and stuff is super cool for a, you know, a game from from this era, but shitty boss fight. Yeah, I think it did a good job of setting my expectations for every other boss fight in this game. <laughs> so as in like they would be terrible and you should be ready for that. Yeah, they, they would just be very janky and probably more frustrating than they needed to be. Yep. I uh, I can't think of any boss fight in this game that I thought was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we get to the end of chapter one and you make your choice. And this is like, you've made choices before that have small ripples, but this is the major choice that defines the rest of your game, basically. So mm-hmm. you either side with uh, Roach, um, kind of like the familiar siding with the humans, or you can take a chance and side with Yorvith. Um, mm-hmm. So who did you guys side with? I went with Yorvith like I didn't hate Roach, but also at the time I definitely felt like, you know, number one, like, you know that I didn't like kill this king, but you're not like telling people that I didn't kill this king. Like you're Mm -hmm. making me help you. Like you're kind of holding that to blackmail me to help you find the king killer, Um, which like, Fair, I'd do that, but also like it sucks that you know I didn't do it and you're not telling people. But then also like I felt misled about like your Vith and the Scoyatel, like by Roach and and the people. And so I was like, I don't necessarily trust you at this point. And so I definitely picked your Vith. Uh plus, you know, I'm a sucker for like the Freedom Fighter like people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I also went with Yorvith my first playthrough for... I mean, the main reason was that Roach had a dumb hat. I mean, he just... <laughs> his hat, his hat is pretty stupid, stupid. Yeah. No, but mostly, <laughs> I mean, it was it was just, yeah, being unfamiliar with these characters in this world and the political conflict and any of that. Like, in the moment, Yorvith seemed like the the better and more interesting choice. Biggest disappointment in The Witcher 3 is that, like, Yorvith is just non-existent, I feel like. Mm-hmm. I think they've come out and said like they they were trying to get him in, but just they couldn't do it or ran out of time or whatever. But Mm -hmm. so like in a post Witcher three world and in a post, you know, like becoming a super fan of of the world and the the books and stuff like I understand and appreciate Roach a lot more now. Uh, But yeah, at the time, 100 percent went Yorvith. And I still think that that's for me the more fun and more interesting path uh because i've my replay that i did recently that i got about like halfway through the game i went with roach because i hadn't played it before and so i was like yeah this is still you know pretty interesting kind of cool but yeah i I think i enjoyed the the elf side better okay (laughs) i picked yorvith also and it was mostly (laughs) because by that point uh roach is kind of a dick and Mm -hmm. uh, yorvith was not a dick yorvith was um more inspiring as a character, I guess. And Mm -hmm. it is, it is kind of like you said, Dylan, that, uh, that freedom fighter lean sounded more interesting from like a game perspective, uh, to follow. So I picked Yorvith, um, and it 
really changes what chapter two is like. Um, but yeah. before chapter two, there is this event that happens that sets off like one of the subplots of chapter two, which is uh, you've been with Triss in Flotsam this whole time. Uh, Triss has been helping out. There was another sorceress there named Sheila who mm-hmm. was new to me, um, maybe in the books, Andrew. Yeah, she's definitely in the book. She's in Witcher 3 as well, but she plays a smaller role. Right. Um, So they're introduced. They have like a room at the top of this brothel, and they have a a megascope there, which can make teleporting portals and shit like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So while you're out doing your thing with uh, Yorvith or Roach, Letho, who is the Witcher who killed the kings, got into the room and forced them to take him through the portal. So uh, Triss to take him through the portal. So now Triss is gone. And this is like a new subplot. You're going to have to do the story with Yorvith uh, for all three of us or Roach, if you picked him, but also you have to find Triss also. Now, right before this happened, like Triss and Geralt were about to kind of, they had already come up with this agreement to, to finally get his memories back. So like he's on the very yeah. brink of getting his memories back when Triss gets ripped away. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have a boss fight against Letho in chapter one, also in these uh, elven ruins. It's a classic, like yeah. you whoop his ass in the boss fight and then he whoops your ass in the cutscene and <laughs> yeah. escapes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so on to, uh, to chapter two. So all three of us picked Yorvith, which means we get the side where you go to the city Mm-hmm. That I did not write down the name of Vergen. That's the city's name. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is a dwarf city, which is cool because you you don't see dwarves that much in The Witcher Three. They're kind of chilling in taverns and stuff. And you work with yeah. um, you know, you work with your buddy, the dwarf. Who I forget his Zoltan. name. Zoltan. Zoltan. Yeah. How could I forget Zoltan? <laughs> Dude, where's my car? <laughs> <laughs> so you work with him in that game, but not many other dwarves. Now you get a whole dwarf city, which is a really cool setting. It's like winding mm-hmm. all these passageways and mm-hmm. stuff like into mountain, like mine shafts and out on the other side of the city and stuff. It's a, it's a cool place. And you're thrown into this like new conflict over here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're just there because you, you got word that Triss, well, a man and a woman fell out of a portal in the sky, which who mm-hmm. else could that possibly be? Right. Yeah. So if you picked Roach, you go to the other side of this conflict, which is this uh, Nilfgaardian like war camp, basically, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I didn't see this. So before we talk about like the side that the three of us all saw, um, either of you have any insight on like, was this fun on the other side? This is where my like second playthrough stalled out. Um, I got to the camp. I did the some of the stuff with Henselt. I did some of the side quests where you have to like help this guy whose son is going to fight in this like they have this fighting pit thing that they do for entertainment and his mm-hmm. son's going to fight in there. He feels like honor bound to fight this guy that just like brutally murders anybody he fights. So then you go in and like do a tag team fight and help him win. So there's like there's some interesting side quests and stuff uh you have the opportunity to romance vests in the in the camp but ultimately you're doing you're trying to you know solve the the curse and everything just from that side of the battlefield um but then beyond that the my only experience is like what i watched um like other people play and like recaps and stuff because i didn't ever actually finish act two on my playthrough i got probably about three quarters of the way through it but it was okay it was fine, but I feel like I definitely, I liked the setting less. I liked the characters less. Like, like you mentioned earlier, being in a dwarven city is just so much more interesting. Um, and then the, the kind of the conflict and the, what your, for, your, your big choice at the end of all that was really cool. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, the stuff that you're doing on Roach's side is it's still good. I, I still think it's quality. I don't think like one is the great version and the other one was like the, the rushed, like half-assed version or anything like that. I just found mm-hmm. myself more drawn to the Yorvith path. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. I, in watching like the two, it, uh, in just kind of some of the refreshers, like 
I, I have to just echo Andrews, you know, like I the Yorvis path and the characters in it, like Zoltan and Dandelion and all of those, it's like they seemed more interesting, like Saskia, um, like all of those to me just interested me more. Um, and with like, of course, the exclusion of Yorvith and Saskia in The Witcher 3, uh, like Zoltan and Dandelion are pretty like major players and in, in yeah. a big part of The Witcher 3, uh, whereas Roach like is in The Witcher 3 um but isn't like necessarily a huge huge part of it yeah you you work with him for a little while and then you never see her see him again so mm -hmm. i should say before this like plot in either one of these cities uh you know the war camp or the city gets started there's like a, a prelude to it where you play as uh prince stennis mm -hmm. who is being invaded uh by the king henselt or you uh, play as henselt on the other side or you play as henselt if you pick roach is yeah. that how it works yep okay gotcha so i played as stennis um mm -hmm. and i'm guessing it plays out the same uh basically so they're fighting near this like big obelisk or something um and one of the i can't remember who someone bashes a soldier's head in like on the obelisk and it like activates yeah it was henselt on on that my most recent playthrough yeah so he he smashes someone's head on it i think it was henselt in my game too yeah mm -hmm. so anyway it activates this thing and it activates this uh this curse basically where a bunch of wraith soldiers rise up and it separates the two cities from the two perspectives because in the middle there's this endless war of like skeleton armies fighting that you can't go in there or you'll die. Uh, so part of like this chapter is, you know, dealing with all like find Triss, find Letho, all of these things. But first you have to solve this curse so that you can like cross this battle zone. And I thought this was really cool Witcher shit too. Yeah. Right. This, this curse mm -hmm. that, brings about basically this endless war yeah it's because if i'm remembering correctly like you're having to kind of like go around and figure out like well what what caused this how do we yeah. stop it what what can i like what do i need to prepare like it, it, it similar to like the karen fight where it's like okay i'm gonna read up on this i'm gonna talk to people i'm gonna like do all of this and i'm gonna make some preparations and figure out like how i need to draw this out and deal with it once and for all yeah uh so what it, it it's like the other side of witcher knowledge like so witchers have all this knowledge about how to kill all these monsters too but they also know how to break curses mm -hmm. so that's what you're trying to figure out here yeah and you find out that like during this battle which wasn't that long ago like they're skeleton armies but like the battle was pretty recent mm -hmm. uh, there's people on both sides who were there fighting um a sorceress in that battle basically did a war crime and like called down this like spell that f even all the other sorceresses were like, yo, what the fuck? Like you can't do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, basically caused this curse because of all the death and destruction. And she was burned at the stake uh, for doing this um, by her own King. And uh, that's why the curse is here. So you're mm. trying to break the curse by finding artifacts. And then you actually go in and do like little role playing segments as different soldiers in this battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where I got on the on the Roach side is that the sorceress worked for Henselt. He's the one that burned her at the stake, and right when she's burning, she curses him. And so on that side, you're you think that as she's burning, she cursed him that like all these things would happen to him, and that's kind of what you're investigating to see like did that trigger all this and make it happen and i never i didn't i didn't quite get to the very end of it to see exactly how like it it concludes on that end but yeah so that's you're working with death mold the like his creepy sorcerer <laughs> advisor and stuff and so like it's you have you have a slightly different information on that side that you're going off of mm -hmm. and it almost feels like maybe a little bit more information or at least what you feel like it's like oh this is pretty obvious she cursed him mm -hmm. i got to figure out why how she did it and then undo it mm -hmm. cuz you you learn 
that she was the one who like brought down this spell and that was how all these people died in this horrible way. You learn that like pretty far into Yorvith's side in chapter two. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason I laughed is uh, all think about all those times when you like meet a character in a fantasy story, especially, and they have like the most evil sounding name possible, <laughs> but they're not yep. evil yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the reveal that they're evil is going to come in like, you know, later on in the movie or something like that. But like this motherfucker's name is death mold. Yeah. Like, yep. Come on. Yeah. Like, yep. He's like sitting it's, there snacking. It's without the A though. Yeah. It's there's no okay. A. It's not yeah. death. It's just death. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like death clock. Or mega exactly. Death. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this, uh, this, this battlefield scene is pretty cool. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you kind of do these short little set piece things. So first you play as a messenger who you have to dodge these rains of arrows to deliver a message on the battlefield. Um, and then you fight as just a regular soldier. And then you fight as a general who the way to break the curse is to keep this person from getting killed uh, mm-hmm. somehow. And you have to fight a giant Draugr or something like that. It's just like a big dude, a big fat guy. Yeah. yeah. And it's another just, just truly awful boss fight. I had mm. such a hard time with this, even on easy mode, uh, mm. because he would charge and I would dodge and I would still get hit. Yep. Gotta love it. Yep. So uh, you end up breaking the curse. Um, the other side of this, like from Yorvith's path, which we all played, is uh, this this woman named Saskia, who's mm. a warrior on the side of um, Stennis uh, mm. against the Nilfgaardians and Henselt. And she's like this like ultimate warrior and she, she killed a dragon supposedly mm-hmm. and she gets poisoned and she basically becomes sleeping beauty for this whole thing. And you have to like break the curse mm-hmm. that's keeping her asleep. And you're working with Philippa Earhart, which is interesting uh, because she's in the Witcher three uh, yep. and she doesn't have eyes in the Witcher three, but she has eyes in this game. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's reconstructing her eyes in The Witcher 3 because of what happens in this game. And yeah. she is very invested in killing a certain king in The Witcher 3 because she doesn't have eyes. Right. Yep. <laughs> so, like, when I saw her name there, I was like, oh, shit. Oh, she has eyes. Okay, we're mm-hmm. going to see what happens mm-hmm. in this game. So that's going to be cool. But you're working with her, <laughs> it's gonna too. going to be cool. Uh, to, yeah. Yep. Uh, it's going to be some Witcher shit. Exactly. Yep. Uh, it's not quite Resident Evil shit, but it's Witcher shit yep. for sure. Um, so you're working with her to try and save Saskia. And mm-hmm. um, again, multiple plot threads going on. You're trying to save Saskia. You're trying to defend the city. There's a big battle scene where they get invaded. And it it's one of those old video game battles where it's like the overwhelming force is coming. And then like you see them and it's like 15 guys <laughs> yeah like yeah. run into the city <laughs> we, we put as many dudes as we could on the screen and it's yeah. like oh okay like back then that was impressive now yeah no. <laughs> mm-hmm. there's some other cool witcher stuff like there's some um some harpies that are stealing dreams from people and you get to go in mm-hmm. and like watch people's dreams and stuff that's kind of cool just yeah. you know nightmare witcher stuff that again it's living hell living in this world <laughs> exactly <laughs> But you get like the big reveal here that Saskia didn't kill a dragon. She is the dragon. Uh, And she reveals it during one of the like climactic moments in this chapter. And not only is she a dragon, she's the same dragon that attacked in the prologue all that Mm -hmm. time ago. Remember, like during the prologue, people were thinking and like wondering out loud, like, why is there a dragon here? Dragons shouldn't be here. That's why. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, is this like a thing in Witcher lore that like dragons can take the form of people? Because I'd never seen that before. Yeah, I think so. Because in the book and in the first season of the show, there's that guy with like his two like female uh, warrior like escorts or whatever that that Geralt is helping. And then it turns out that like he's a dragon and he's trying to defend like his mates eggs or something i can't remember exactly like the conclusion of that story but yeah he's he's just like an old unassuming guy for most of the episode or the story in the book and then turns out to be a dragon at the end so it does seem to be i don't think it's something that happens all that often 
Like it's still pr- mm-hmm. like even Geralt's probably still kind of like, wow, that's unusual. But yeah, it's it is something that can happen. It's not something CD Projekt like made up for the game. Yeah, but gotcha. I know like in World of Warcraft, that's how it works. Like the their dragons take human or like the form of like a humanoid for the most part. Um, I'm trying to think. I think D and D like also a lot. Mm. Like you can polymorph or whatever. So it wasn't like crazy, but it was also like still a big reveal of like, oh shoot, because oh, yeah. this was again, this was my first time experiencing the world of The Witcher, and so not knowing that like people could be dragons in it, it was like, oh shoot, like that's <laughs> that's a dragon right there. Yeah. So this this like Joan of Arc almost like stand in is actually the dragon. Yeah. And uh, not only is she a dragon, she's being controlled by mm. uh, Philippa. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's it's Philippa either in, increases her control or takes control like while she's being like while she's down from the poison. It's because mm. she like she puts like the rose of remembrance on her lips and then kisses her at the end of like this awakening ceremony and i think that was yeah implied to be like her taking control or something like that yeah Mm -hmm. so um due to what's going to happen later um it's not great that philippa is in control of a dragon um no and she's doing it to uh to try and install uh sheila as a a prominent court member uh, to mm-hmm. give more power to the sorceresses, basically. Yeah, Philippa is consistently like the most conniving of the sorceresses and kind of like the leader of the lodge and one of the the least trustworthy and you can never take anything at face value kind of characters in the world. And that's why her and Dijkstra as like a as a couple is such a like kind of crazy powerful pairing because they're both like that just in similar they run in different circles Mm -hmm. you know but they have like similar Mm -hmm. agendas and similar abilities they're both like very good at playing the game and so yeah her having a dragon is not ideal (laughs) (laughs) yeah so uh there's a lot more going on here but um you know basically you you repel if you're playing yorvitz path you repel the attack Mm mm-hmm Saskia turns into a dragon to help you fight. And um, I forget if it's during this part that you kill death mold or if it's later or no, you death mold gets captured and then is dragged off to be executed Mm -hmm. uh, basically. But the important part is that you're following the trail of um, Triss and kind of a weird thing. You, the Geralt like walks out onto the land between, I think it's between the cursed battlefield and the Nilfgaardian camp and there's a dead body and it's got like a wooden figurine and he just picks it up uh, just mm-hmm. kind of randomly. And it turns out that that's Triss. Triss has yeah. been turned into a wooden figurine because, again, this is hell world to live <laughs> in. Uh, that's yes. a thing that can happen to people. And it's kind of weird because uh, I picked Yorvith. I snubbed Roach. Um, there was a scene earlier in Chapter 1 where Yorvith and Roach are going to fight and I gave Yorvith his sword back so he mm-hmm. could fight back. Roach still helps you here Mm -hmm. for some reason. Like, I guess maybe he is just a a solid dude. And he's like, yeah, you know, bygones be bygones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Roach and Geralt always, at least in the games, I I don't think even think he's a a book character, but like they always kind of have this, what feels like this mutual understanding of each other's kind of code and morals and jobs. And so it's like when we, when we have to cross, like when we have to clash, we will, but if our goals align, then they align. We both kind of have mm-hmm. like this mutual respect and like understanding mm-hmm. of each other, but that doesn't necessarily make us like best friends. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And they might take opposite sides, obviously, like it happens here. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I only really bring this up because uh, at the end of this, you have to get into this Nilfgaardian camp and you have two ways to get in. Um, and it's just gameplay uh memorable gameplay here you can either bribe uh one of the ladies at the um the brothel outside the camp to mm. like give you the key to like this underground tunnel but it's really fucking expensive and i didn't have the money <laughs> mm-hmm. the other way to get in is to do uh one of like the ultimate gaming faux pas like whenever people talk about like what do you hate most in video games what tropes do you hate People always say stealth missions in games that aren't stealth games. 
And that happens in this game, and it's terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This game doesn't even really have a stealth system, so it's like, how are you going to... No, not at all. I'm glad that they uh, dropped that for The Witcher 3. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Did not try to do that again, that I remember. The way you have to get through this is um, you have to sneak and, like, wait for the soldiers to walk by, but eventually you get to a point where there's a cook that gets scared when he sees you and runs away. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in the entire game, you have to use the, um, Axie, the Jedi mind trick Axie on the cook and just tell him to like lay down or something. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And he will. And that's how you beat it. I had to look it up because you've never been able to do that on people (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) to any effect. Right. Yeah, it's it's one of those like I didn't know that I had that move. I didn't know I could do this. It's only yeah. like sort of stunned uh monsters occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, that's the end of um of chapter two, unless there's any notable mm-hmm. other things that you guys had to or want to bring up. I mean, in the in the Roach side, uh I think it all kind of falls apart with Henselt killing all of Roach's men and um Oh, okay. Like sexually abusing Vess and so then you have the option as Geralt to let Roach kill him or stop him from killing him and I'm pretty sure like based on some of the things that happen in like The Witcher 3 like dialogue and stuff that the the canon thing that happens is that Roach kills him Uh, Mm -hmm. and so that I'm not sure if that how that all plays out if Geralt is on the mm-hmm. opposite side, but it could make sense that like if Roach is now it's just Roach and Vest, they're alone. He's lost all his men. He's trying to get out. That he would meet back up with Geralt and be like, "Hey, let's do this together," you know, because he's yeah. yeah, he's kind of lost it all on that side. Yeah, well, and I forget which one of you said it earlier too, but like Roach is always kind of like doing stuff for Tamaria. Yeah, uh, and so like. Uh, Hensel is that his name? Hensel yeah. uh, is not like he's no guardian, right? Yeah, he doesn't have like, ties to him. He was just yeah. they, they were there. He was the convenience. It, yeah, side it was like out of for Roach to go convenience to. and just because they couldn't really go any further due to the curse and everything. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, Hensel ends up like double crossing him. Gotcha. Yeah, and it makes sense too why you know in The Witcher Three he just hates no guardian so much uh, mm-hmm. and another character, uh, but. <laughs> And why he's like just hiding in a cave with a group of like merry men, essentially. Mm-hmm. Like he's to marry yeah, us, yeah. really struggling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you get into uh, to chapter three, and this takes place in Loch Muin, which is mm-hmm. kind of like a, it feels like city ruins yeah. Uh, yeah. to me. It feels like a cursed place. It's a very mm-hmm. cool setting for Witcher stuff. Again, it's another one of those places where I'm like, I don't feel like people could live and have a society here when there's <laughs> gargoyles attacking yeah. everywhere yeah. you go. <laughs> but you're, uh, you're trying to find Triss um, and because the figurine got stolen from Geralt at the end of uh, chapter two. And you're trying to find uh, Philippa because she's in control of a dragon. Um, And it turns out both of them have uh, been captured. Triss gets reanimated. The uh, cutscene where they bring her back to life looks very painful. Mm -hmm. Uh, So again, hell world. Exactly. Um, And you uh, find Philippa and they basically cut her eyes out for being insubordinate as a prisoner, as far as I remember it. Mm -hmm. So that was, I mean, cool in quotation marks to see that, but also in the back of your head, you're like, Oh, she's really pissed off now. And she's in control of a dragon. This is, uh, Mm -hmm. this is not great. Wasn't Radovid there. Yeah. I I can't remember. I think Radovid took her eye, like either he directly yeah. took her eyes or or, or okay, commanded sure. somebody to like it was it was a very personal thing because i think philippa was supposed to be like in his service and so mm-hmm. i don't know if he found out that like she was trying to work an angle with this dragon she was trying to do something outside of what he wanted and so then when he got a hold of her again he cut her eyes out and then that's why in three she's 
he's still hunting her and then she can help you end up ultimately assassinating him if you take that quest mm-hmm. yeah that's a yep. fun quest too yeah oh, it's yes, amazing it um so like i'm just kind of like yada 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 through a lot of this chapter where you're just kind of mm-hmm. like exploring the ruins um it's kind of a weird place like there's multiple armies there different factions some of them will attack you some of them won't yeah mm-hmm. it's a it's an interesting place but like the main thing is you're you're building toward this confrontation uh first with Sheila uh, because mm-hmm. she's evil and um she goes to run away she gets in her megascope and it's another kind of choice you can make uh Letho has stolen one of the crystals and replaced it with a fake and mm-hmm. you can uh you can let her explode in this like broken megascope or you can let her uh, leave and if you let her leave she'll tell you where yennefer is who you have not heard about for most of this game now mm-hmm. did you let her leave yeah i did yeah mm-hmm. I, th- I think i did too as well yeah, um and I then did. you know she ultimately meets her demise in in the next game in a pretty <laughs> terrible way so you know this might have been quicker but right. you don't know that at the time but yeah it uh the yennefer thing it's cool how it kind of sets up like it's kind of like leading into the next game and everything. But this whole sequence, A, because like I didn't really, the first time I played this game was still kind of like having trouble differentiating like all these different sorceresses, all these different like Mm -hmm. warring factions. This Mm -hmm. act three felt like it went by fast and it was confusing and like just Mm -hmm. stuff was happening to characters. And I'm like, I don't know who... I yeah. know I I know I'm going to pick Triss cuz I know her. I've known her the whole time. Like I got Triss, but outside of that mm. and like Yorvith and Roach, I know them. But just everything else was like I felt like it was all happening around me and I was just making the best of it. <laughs> I I want to go back and eventually finish my playthrough and go through it all with like the knowledge that I've gained since that first playthrough because yeah, the mm-hmm. first time I went through it all it was like just a flurry of events all kind of mm. happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean I I said I was yada yada yadaing through a lot of it because I don't know a lot of these people still and a lot of these mm-hmm. factions and country names and all of that stuff and yeah. they're all in the same place for this uh yeah. this last yeah. chapter so it's even more confusing. Yeah, like this this chapter definitely felt the most like linear in in like there weren't I don't remember there being like a bunch of side quests and stuff in chapter 3. I think it was mostly like here like you're wrapping up a lot of the like plot points that you've been kind of following throughout the the game Mm -hmm. but it was also the one that felt to me again like as my first like exposure to the witcher universe this chapter felt like i don't know who any of these people are like i don't (laughs) this is the one that made me feel lost the most in Mm -hmm. like i don't even like this is about like world politics for a a universe that i don't really know the world yeah versus the more personal stories that were kind of like chapters one and two so yeah exactly um and this is this is the chapter where you would have the most benefit of having read the books or played the first game or both uh, Mm -hmm. to come in here and be like i know these countries i know these kings i know these uh, generals i know all of these. And it can be so different depending on the choices that you've made uh, Mm -hmm. throughout the game, not just Yorvith versus Roach, like tons of other micro choices that you've made can Mm -hmm. influence who's even here in this chapter. So yeah, just kind of like stick into the memorable stuff here. Yeah. After uh, that thing with uh, Sheila, you go up to the top of this tower and you fight uh, Saskia, the dragon. Um, Mm -hmm. It is a, another just terrible boss fight in my opinion. It's mm-hmm. again, same stuff that's plagued all the other ones attacks that you dodge out of the way and you still get hit. Even playing on easy mode, this was like not super easy. You're fighting a dragon, so it, I guess it shouldn't be easy, but <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, not great. No. Um, and then you have a big choice after this. You, uh, Geralt, at least in my game, there's multiple endings to just this one boss fight. Um, Mm -hmm. and this kind of conclusion with Saskia in my game, Saskia got impaled on a tree in dragon form and I had the choice to save or kill Saskia and I killed, um, the dragon. Wow. Well, Philippa's, um, I did not mess with Philippa. Like maybe I saw a cutscene of her, like stumbling out of the city or whatever, but I was like, 
she's probably still in control of this. I better take this dragon mm. out. Yeah. This was something that I didn't like. I don't really remember very clearly from my playthrough, but I was watching a, a video about like what will Geralt do, and basically like the if you they kind of frame it like if you leave the dragon there impaled, you're leaving it to die, but mm-hmm. you could do yeah. like a mercy killing. But really, if you leave her there, you're letting her live because that's not like a fatal blow for a dragon apparently. Mm-hmm. So. The murky part, like you're mentioning, is yeah, does Philippa still have control? But this is another thing that would have been so cool to see integrated into three somehow, because it's such a huge mm-hmm. plot point. Like, if Saskia lives, it's such a major event. It's such a major thing that has happened between Geralt, Saskia, and Philippa. And Geralt and Philippa interact quite a bit in The Witcher 3, but there's no... Like, I think there might be, like, one line about Saskia or something. Like, they ride her off, like, real mm. quick. And it's like, man, yeah. it would have been cool to see how that could have inter, like <laughs> intermingled with what's going on here. But also, like, if you have, yeah. like, a dragon on your side or Philippa's side or something, like, that does definitely complicate things from, like, a writing perspective. So it yeah. was definitely easier probably just to ride her out. Yeah, it's like a, you know, it kind of like Game of Thrones. Like, having a dragon is like having nuclear bombs. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So... I'm trying to remember because I feel like I didn't kill her, but like, here, like lifted a curse or something. I think you can, like, maybe that's the thing you can do is you can let her live and then like break a... Philippa's control. Mm-hmm. But it's... I know you can do that because I saw a cutscene of Geralt talking to Saskia, and mm-hmm. Saskia was like really like rude to him despite mm-hmm. him like breaking the curse <laughs> and saving her life. <laughs> yeah. Which is typical Witcher fashion. I see. Yeah, exactly. Um, now that you've done the thing I need you to do, I'm just going to be a huge dick to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just how it works. So after this thing, you, you finally have your confrontation with Letho and I, I'll be honest, I forgot that Letho was mm-hmm. the ultimate goal here. So yeah. you go fight him and you have like, or you can fight him. You have the choice to mm-hmm. fight him or just say like, you know what, man, like our conflict was so long ago that it doesn't matter anymore, which is, mm-hmm. ba- that's the choice that I made. It, it felt like yeah. Geralt would have been like, ah, I mean, things have gone so far since the beginning of the game when Letho was the enemy that mm-hmm. it just felt right to just be like, you know what, just just get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. But, and that's the choice I made too. And I, I had a lot more like empathy for Letho by the end of the game. You know, like at the beginning yeah. of the game, they do a good job of just like he's this merciless killer. Uh, and then the more that you get to know him, the more that you get memories back, the more that you find out like all of the manipulation and politicking that these kingdoms are doing. And it's like he was just you know doing a Witcher thing and making some money and like. Most of these kings, like realistically, sucked as people, and so it's kind of yeah. just like I don't, I don't know that it's you know like, like it sucks that now there are all these wars and all these you know peasants are like tied up in these wars now, but at the same time, like most of the kings that you interact with are just huge assholes. So <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm like, eh, it's fine, man. Like apparently we were cool back in the day and so like unless you want to kill me like i guess we can be cool now yeah he uh uh, you know apparently he helps you you can't remember that because you have no memory but apparently you know in your in your past he had helped you out um also he was just a pawn like you were mentioning dylan and then apparently like if you i didn't make this choice myself but if you choose to like help philippa in the end game and not rescue Triss immediately, Letho mm. will rescue Triss and like kill everybody. And you meet like when you meet him in that like courtyard for the final confrontation, Triss is out there with him on like there's a pile mm. of bodies behind him, all the people he killed to get to her. So like ultimately he yeah, exactly. He's just doing Witcher things. He's not really a bad guy. They did a pretty good mm. job like with his character design too, kind of initially making you be like, oh, this guy's just a dumb brute. Like yeah, mm-hmm. I don't, but he's more than that. And I really like how if you let him go and then you transfer that into the next game, like I like how they integrated him into The Witcher 3. Yeah, that's yeah. that's 
part of why I let him go because I know he's in The Witcher 3 if you let him live. And I wanted, because I'm going to replay The Witcher 3 soon-ish, yeah. and I want him to be in there after having seen the history of him in this game. Um, mm-hmm. His his motivation was kind of interesting. He was sent by the Emperor of Nilfgaard uh, to just destabilize things uh, mm-hmm. because in the beginning of Witcher 3, Nilfgaard is invading all these territories. So mm-hmm. just kind of preparing for that. And they promised him, um, he's from a, a Witcher school, the Viper school, which is defunct basically. Yeah. And they promised him that they'd help him rebuild the Witcher school, which is important to Witchers, right? Mm-hmm. Like the wolf school is really important to Geralt. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, his motivation was cool. The, all the work they did to humanize him throughout the game, but also I, I really think there is a cool aspect to them starting out with like, this is the main problem that you have to solve. And then mm-hmm. by the end of the game, you're like, man, I don't give a shit like <laughs> about what left. Everyone knows I didn't kill the Kings now. Like, I don't care if people think I killed the Kings. It doesn't matter to me. Mm-hmm. And like Letho's not this like heartless, dumb, evil, uh, you know, brute, like you said. So, ah, just fuck it. Like, just get out of here, man. Like we're cool. Yep. That mm-hmm. felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, well, you and I want to Leth- say, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I want to say I left, like I went for Philippa and not Triss Ooh. Um, in my game. Cause I, <laughs> I, I assume Triss could handle herself. True. Uh huh. <laughs> because Philippa had no eyes, uh, and she had a dragon. So I was like, whatever you got to say to like justify bigger problem. it, man. Uh, you know. <laughs> but also, like, like you said, going in and seeing that Letho had saved Triss was kind of like, I don't care what what you did. We're even <laughs> <now>. <laughs> like, <laughs> even though he was the one that like kidnapped her in the first place, but you know, we'll we'll let that slide. Yeah. So you guys mentioned the um the fact that Letho kind of helps Geralt regain the last of his memories. And so this is kind of like that last plot thread, uh, which is setting up Geralt. Cause when I played the Witcher three, which is subtitled the wild hunt, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, in that game that Geralt has a history with the wild hunt, Mm -hmm. but you don't really know what it is. And they explain it here at the end of this game or like throughout this game in bits and pieces, but you, you get the full explanation at the end. Uh, so you basically learn how Geralt Geralt came to ride with the wild hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So he this is really funny yeah. story. <laughs> uh, I will say that um, he and uh, Yennefer got um, that there was a, a skirmish. I think it was in Rivia, right? The, mm-hmm. There was a revolt where Geralt yeah. got hurt really badly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yennefer was trying to heal him uh, and they, they both got transported to this magical island that's like outside of reality our dimension yeah yeah um and they just could spend all of eternity doing what Geralt and Yennefer do there mm-hmm. yeah so that's kind of the like the somewhat ambiguous ending to the books is okay they're they're in this tavern or whatever this riot breaks out in town Geralt and Yennefer are trying basically just to get out and then Geralt gets impaled by this pitchfork and yeah, is just like bleeding out and Yennefer's trying to heal him. And I can't remember if like she takes a stab or whatever too, but they end up just like dying in the middle of this street. So then mm. Siri and or her unicorn, it's 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 a Kelpie. It's um, I guess they're called a Kelpie. Comes and rescues them and takes them to this island. But that's kind of at least the way that people, mo- the majority of people read that is they died and this is their like, it's like afterlife an afterlife or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's like they're done, but it was all, it was also like open-ended enough and slightly magical and mystical enough to be like, okay, CDPR can pick up that thread and they can mm-hmm. go, Oh, well, they were just outside of reality all this time. All we have to do is kind of write them back into the world and we can keep telling stories. Mm hmm. Right. So what they did and like, you know, who can access this magical island that sits outside of reality? The Wild Hunt. Exactly. Yep. So they went to the island. Um, they kidnapped Yennefer um, and then 
Geralt somehow got back to the real world. Um, not quite sure how. Yeah. Andrew, do you know? I yeah, I'm not sure. This is kind of that like foggy in between. Uh, it's fantasy, but it's like yeah, he probably was like chasing after them. Maybe they went through a portal that he missed or something and ended up back in the real world. Like it. Yeah, it's not the most important part of the story. I'm sure it's out there, yeah. but there's a lot to remember. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's out in the real world. He comes across Letho and Letho's buddies. Uh, he saves them from like a monster they were fighting. And then Letho being like the absolute like cool dude that he is like <laughs> fights against the wild hunt with Geralt, like signs mm-hmm. up for that. Like, yeah. yeah, sure. I'll fight the wild hunt. That's cool. <laughs> and then um, so they fought to a stalemate. Geralt offered himself in return for everyone else's safety, basically. And that's how he came to ride with the Wild Hunt. And all of that time going between dimensions or whatever the fuck the Wild Hunt can do, is that's why he can't remember anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that revelation and all of that was really cool. I enjoyed like that backstory. It was, you know, the story of why someone lost their memories could go a lot of different ways. And I just thought this was really satisfying and worth, you know, bringing up on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing about this universe is like you've, we mentioned everything at the beginning about like, you got the political drama, you got the different races, you've got magic, you've got like mages, you've got alchemy, you've got all that stuff. That's already a lot. But then Siri has the elder blood, which like allows her to do this like dimensional travel and then the wild hunt are from like another dimension. They want her powers. So the the whole story in the books is like her being taken back to their world and they're trying mm-hmm. to ultimately like impregnate her so they can have that power in their like bloodline. And so she's like she goes to like King Arthur's realm and all sorts of stuff. And then I guess she ultimately like kind of escapes and that's where, you know, where Witcher 3 picks up is she's hiding out in between dimensions and, you know, that's where they throw in like the cyberpunk Easter eggs and stuff like that. <laughs> and and so like then you have that kind of like sci-fi element almost on top of this like crazy fantasy world where like the Wild Hunt and Siri, like this super superior race of elves, like they have this ability to travel between dimensions and then it just kind of blows the doors wide open on like anything they want to do, which is really, it's really interesting Mm -hmm. across the Witcher verse. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It's kind of interesting how like they do have this space for infinite possibility, but the, at least so far the the stories they've chosen to tell all wrap up really nicely. I feel like, like there's, Mm -hmm. There's not a whole, and it doesn't spin out of control like a, you know, a Final Fantasy game yeah. might do, um, despite having all of this, like, we have multiple dimensions and all of this stuff. They they still keep it pretty tight when it comes to the stories they choose to tell um, mm-hmm. for now. We'll see. We'll see where they go. Yeah, and they, well, yeah. and they do a really good job of, like, that power is super special in this universe and really like yeah. rare and it's sought after. So it's not like, not like anybody can just throw open a portal to another dimension. So that allows for like 90% of the storytelling in the Witcher to be kind of more like grounded fantasy, if you will. Yeah. And then, and, and Siri can't control it either. Right. That's the whole thing in the Witcher three is her like, yeah trying to learn how to actually control this power. That's, I mean, that's kind of her the whole thing since her and Geralt meet, but like in the Witcher three, right. She's like really kind of finally starting to get to grips with it. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. That's one. Of, uh, I love this universe. I, it's really fascinating to me. Yeah. This has been a good time guys. I, I appreciate yeah. you taking uh, over two and a half hours to, to talk about the Witcher two, which is a game that, you know, for, for as good a reviews as it got back in the day and, as many people as I know that make podcasts about video games, no one is doing podcasts about The Witcher 2. So I appreciate mm-hmm. you uh, coming on the show to talk about it with me because, you know, as much as I shit on the gameplay, the story <laughs> is legit interesting and it was a really entertaining ride. So I, I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. It was a good time. Yeah, thanks for having us. Of course. Um, so everyone listening who made it to the end, I appreciate you all very much too. We'll give the uh, the customary reminder 
to check out your friendly neighborhood gamers. Hopefully when I was doing my plugs before the spoiler break, you took my advice and clicked the link to their website. But if not, go do it right now Mm. or I'm going to come find you. (laughs) So thank you everybody for listening. Tune in next week for the next game to come out of the backlog.